College Station, Texas. Some 70,000 fans on hand, and we're expecting a wild one. The Baylor Bears and the Texas Aggies Southwest Conference football action. Now, over the years, A&M has dominated this series. As you can see, last year, though, Baylor won it 20-15. to 15. The Bears have won three of the last four here and six of the last eight overall. Now, as far as the Southwest Conference standings are concerned, A&M, one of three teams still undefeated in the conference. Baylor is at 2-1-1. They cannot afford a loss today. Hello again, everybody. Corey McFerrin with Lynn Swan. And if your idea of good football is three yards in a cloud of dust, this is not your game today. We got a couple of clubs that hold nothing back, throw the ball up, truly explosive football. We'll see some, some fun things today. Certainly they're an explosive football team, and the Baylor team is yet led by a young man by the name of Cody Carlson. Now this is his first year that he's had the control of the offensive unit by himself, and he runs a multiplicity of formations based on the beer. Now, he has a big offensive line in front of him, not in height, but in size. And they will be pushing people down that field, so we think they can move the football very well. On the opposite side of the ball for the Baylor Bears, Thomas Everett, the All-American, is back to lead his team. Last year, he led a defensive secondary that was number three in the country. They've already started their record climb for 1986. Now, for, now if you really don't believe that this defensive unit is solid, just listen to Kevin Murray, the quarterback for A&M, as he talks about the Baylor defense. For Baylor, they, they like to stuff the run. I mean, they'll put eight guys on the line, string the stuff to run, and they, they can cause a lot of problems for you. But what we have to do is we can't let them do that. We have to spread them out, create mismatches in the secondary, and take every out of center field, which is the most important thing, because he'll sit in center field, and he'll read my eyes, the quarterback's eyes, and he'll just rob you all day. And that's why he's one of the, uh, the leading interceptors right now in the nation, is because he does a good job of playing free safety. Kevin Murray shows maturity in paying his respect to that defense. He himself is the MVP of the Southwest Conference, and he didn't get there by overrating teams. Now, for the Baylor, for the Texas A&M defense, they are led by Johnny Holland. He is a tough young man. He plays aggressive football. He will come in, and he will attack like a lion. This young man will have to be an impact player and be a key player for this ballgame this afternoon. You know, one of the fun things about doing a football game here at College Station is the wonderful tradition the Aggies have here. And one of the best is the 12th man tradition. Becky Dixon right now on the field will tell us all about it. Becky? The story behind the 12th man goes all the way back to 1922. In the final game of that season, Coach Dana Bible had to call upon one of the students sitting in the press box to come down and help out his injury-riddled team. Now, the student actually never got into the game, but he stood on the sidelines, ready and willing. Today, this tale has become tradition. Aggie students never sit during a game. They stand, ready to help out when needed. They truly are this team's 12th man. Now, in 1982, when Jackie Sherrill first came to this school, he was so impressed by this tradition that he developed the 12th man kickoff squad. This team is composed entirely of non-scholarship athletes. Now, some have called them crazy, others have even called them suicidal, but no one has ever argued with their success. In the past three seasons, they have not allowed a kick return for a touchdown, they have not allowed a kick return to the 50-yard line, nor a return for more than 29 yards. But even more than that, they are a true motivational factor for this Texas A&M team. Corey? Thank you very much, Becky. Right now, they're singing the Aggie War Hymn at College Station. We'll be back with a kickoff, Baylor and A&M, in just a moment. Ohio Field, it's a beautiful day for football. Some 70 degrees and some 70,000 people on hand today. Baylor and Texas A&M. I'm Corey McFerrin, along with Lynn Swan and Becky Dixon. I'll tell you what, football tradition here at A&M, Lynn, is something else. It's, it's really unlike any place else in the country. The way they take their football, the respect they, they give their football team, the support they give their football team. Talking to Jackie Sherrill yesterday, he said the most interesting thing about football here is you never get booed. And he said he likes that idea pretty much. <laughs> well, that's the whole idea of the 12th man. A football player would never boo his own teammate from the bench. And when you make the fans, the crowd, the alumni, all your supporters a part of your team with the 12th man concept, they support you. They don't give you the blues. They stand behind you. A&M comes in undefeated in Southwest Conference action. The Baylor Bears coming off a loss to SMU last week. Baylor overall is 4-2. and A&M is 4-1. and 
of course last year made a trip to the Cotton Bowl first time they've done that in 18 years no question about it Baylor and AM. the class of the Southwest Conference is here that's Gary Hayes who will kick it up for the Baylor Bears will kick off today back to receive for AM. will be Rod Harris along with Mickey Washington Rod Harris, the most dangerous of those two back there to return. Be interesting to see if Baylor kicks it off to him. And we're underway at Kyle Field. That's Harris in the end zone. He will not bring it out. So the Yankees will bring it out to the 20 yard line. Now they're offense today, and they got a good one, the offensive line. Fontenot is a fellow to watch. He's the top athlete there in your backfield. Vic, he's had two straight 100-yard performances. But Kevin Murray, the top quarterback in the conference, he's the man that makes this offense go. He should go down as the best quarterback in A&M history. Vic is your lone setback. And Murray will put it up immediately. Fires it out. It's complete to Rod Harris. Gate of about nine. Now defensively for Baylor. On the line, look out for Steve Grumbine. First team all-conference player, Ray Berry. He had 13 tackles last week against SMU. In the secondary, here's the guy, Thomas Everett. The All-American Grant Tapp says about Everett, I can't think anybody I've coached to is more knowledgeable for football. Second and one after the nine-yard connection, Murray to Harris. Complete pass. And Harris isn't real pleased about that one. Anthony Coleman supplied the coverage. We'll watch it again, Lynn. Very interesting is that one of the officials called it a complete catch, but another official behind him said it was an incomplete catch. And when this when it's doubt, when there is doubt, then it does not become a complete catch. As Russell Sheffield is in there, the man to take him down. Kevin Marsh in there as well. And Bears fans here at Kyle Field whoop it up a little bit as AM has stopped on their first offensive series. That's Craig Stump. Back to punt for AM. Everett, the man to receive. The All American. He'll take it on the 35-yard line. Across the 40, runs up to about the 46-yard line. And I believe we're going to get a clip against a &M. Or against Baylor, obviously. Here's a flag. We'll see what it is. Usually on the return, you see the official. It's a clip. Two officials on that punt return were right on top of it. It <laughs> must have been very obvious. Clipping by the return team during the run back. First down, 10. The Baylor offense, I tell you what, their offensive line got to be the best in the conference. Attic, the center, strongest, the bunch. Look out for Cody Carlson, the quarterback. He's out of San Antonio. Baylor's all time leader in passing yardage and total offense. They begin at the 26-yard line. Murray, Jeffrey Murray, left side, and he is pushed there. Gain of about two, that AM defense. O'Brien, the nose guard. Coach Cheryl calls him the best nose guard in the conference and in the secondary, or in the linebacking core, I should say, Johnny Holland, an All-American, a Butkus Award candidate. He'll be flying all the field. He is number 11. Carlson. He's going to put it up. 
Fires it out complete far side to about the 37 yard line. That's Leland Douglas. One of the things that this Baylor team will do is give you, as I said at the top of the show, a multiplicity of offensive formations. It's going to be difficult for the A&M secondary and linebackers to pick it up, to read, make their adjustments. Here you see Douglas making the catch, but right there he steps backwards and out of bounds, and it looks like he did that just short of the first down, so it brings up a third and inches situation. Third and inches, and Aggie fans whooping it up, Carlson. I think he fumbled I the football. I think he fumbled the football. At first it looked like a quarterback sneak. The Aggies say they've got it. And we're going to wait for the official signal, but it appears that's the case. It is A&M football at the 35-yard line. Big break. Always, for the rest of this ball game, I think we have to keep in mind what we just saw from Douglas, the receiver. He had a first down when he caught the pass. Then, in trying to elude a defensive player, he stepped backwards out of bounds. Now we come back to third and short. A quarterback sneak might have been the attempt. He fumbles the football. They give it to the Texas A&M Aggies deep in Baylor territory. Hurry to Vic. Trying to slide through, and he does. Look at him go. Inside the 20 ball is loose, and I think Baylor's got it. And they do. Vic, after a tremendous effort. Spinning his way through the line, and guess who's got it? That's right, number 27, Thomas Everett for Baylor. They're all American. Vix trying desperately to pick up the extra yards. This kid is projected to be a number one draft choice when he finishes here in college. Look at his leg strength, his bouncing, driving off people, but it was when he turned around, Corey, he was looking to the inside, was hit from the outside, and the ball popped loose. Anthony Coleman, the man into Vic and forced that ball out so Baylor after one play has got the football back at the 23. Nothing there. For Randy Rutledge hit hard immediately. As Jackie Sherrill looks on, Jackie in his fifth year here at AM. And that record continues to improve every year. Last year, of course, 10 wins, two losses. They go to the Cotton Bowl and knock off Auburn easily, as you recall, 36 to 16. And he loves it here. Second and 12 after the two yard loss. Carlson up in the pocket, dumps it off. That is Jeffrey Murray, got a little bit of room. Good block in front of him. Down to about the 47 yard line was David Davis, who made the downfield block. First down for Baylor. Johnny Holland eventually the man to make the stop. What they're doing is sending the receivers deep downfield and spreading them all over. So when Cody gets in trouble, he steps up, finds his back Jeff Murray, who is just running a short crossing route, looking, waiting to see if he gets in trouble, being there in case he has to dump it off. Good enough for a first down. 25-yard gain for Baylor, three yards away from AM territory. Straight drop back. Carlson fires that ball tipped by Larry Kelm, inside linebacker. Carlson off the mark. Larry Kelm, all Southwest Conference linebacker, 6'4, 220 pounds. The coaches say about this kid, he's very smart, intelligent, and he's going to have to be smart and intelligent to fool Cody Carlson there. You see it right here. He comes over, plays the quarterback well, gets up in the air. Tips it away. That was a sure catch. Second and ten for Carlson. A little play action. Dumps it out across midfield. That's Randy Rutledge. Look at him go. He's going to score maybe, and he does. Rutledge, touchdown, 52 yards. Baylor Bears, we told you they were explosive, averaging more than 450 yards a game, and they're on the scoreboard here with 11 minutes and 26 seconds to go in the first. You take a look at this play as it develops. Randy Ratlitz doing a great job, but look at number 51 right there. That's John Addix, his brother in All-American. Mark Addix played at Baylor. He's downfield. He is the offensive center throwing the key block, which brings him for the touchdown. Extra point from Terry Seiler is good. 
And the Bears have silenced the crowd here at Kyle Field, at least momentarily. They're on the board as Randy Rutledge carries it 52 yards off the arm of Cody Carlson. 7-0, your score. When we want to work up a sweat, nothing works like this. Full-size uh, Chevy pickup. Uh, Got the muscle of a fuel injector, 350 V8. Uh, and it's available on every full-size Chevy. It's got the strength of girder main front suspension. Where? Oh, Plus, double wall construction. So, when you need a tough working partner, nothing works like a Chevy truck. Nothing. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's Rod Harris, Texas A&M, up to the 27-yard line. That scoring drive only took him four plays. Randy Rutledge, his longest catch of the year, his second touchdown reception of the year, Randy Rutledge. A senior out of Florida, Belglade, Florida. So, Texas A&M on offense. Kevin Murray, the offensive player of the year in the Southwest Conference last year, avoids a couple tacklers and fires it out for Keith Woodside. I think he really just threw that ball away. And correct in that, he was under pressure, didn't have a receiver open, receiver that he could see downfield. This young kid, Kevin Murray, has a rocket for an arm. And for you at home, when you're following this game, one way you can tell how fast he throws, when he has a short pass, anywhere from 15, 20, 25 yards, and he's throwing on the straight line, just time it. Look how fast the ball gets there, and look how little arc it has on it when he throws it. For the year, Murray with six touchdowns, 976 yards, and a 61% completion rate. Does not connect there. That ball heading out for Rod Harris. Now, the interesting thing about that man, Kevin Murray, is two years ago, I had that severely broken ankle, missed most of the year, came back, had screws in the ankle. In fact, still does have two remaining in that ankle. And Coach uh, Jackie Sherrill says, hey, if that injury had not happened, he thinks Murray could have been as great a quarterback as there's ever been in college football. He said, hey, he's pretty darn good right now. But he could have been even better. Third and 10 for AM. On the 26-yard line, Murray will be crushed in the backfield, and that's Robert Waters, weak side linebacker for Baylor, who comes through to make the stop and bring Murray down in the third down play. That's his sixth tackle for a loss this year. Murray is very fortunate here because as he's getting hit, he's got that football in one hand and high above his head. Now, he could have been hit, and that ball stripped away, and there would have been a fumble deep in his own backfield. There's the punt, and Everett, the fair catch on the 36-yard line. We are early in the first quarter, a 41-yard punt. Baylor on offense when we come back. They feature the best offensive line in the Southwest Conference. The one thing Jackie Sherrill told us he worried about was perhaps that offensive line just too physical for AM and perhaps worrying them down by the time this game got into the second half. 36 yard line, that handoff there is to Murray, who spins away and takes it to about the 40 yard line. So Murray, a gain of four, maybe five on the play. Alex Morris, the man to bring him down. Now, when you think about what you just said in terms of the offensive line wearing them down, and then their ability, as they showed in their first touchdown drive, to get a touchdown in less than two minutes, uh, if Baylor, I mean, if uh, Texas A&M can't really come after them and take something away, they're going to put points on the scoreboard like Miami did last week. <laughs> Murray and Rutledge in the backfield. The fake to Murray. The option. Carlson will keep across midfield. Look at him go. To the 35. Great option quarterback, as you saw there, 57 yards. Wow. The Beer offense is based on the read. 
Cody just reads this. He sees a man coming to the outside to pick up the pitch, and he just takes it right upfield. What he does best on this play is he takes it directly upfield. He doesn't veer it to the outside to give the man who's covering the pitch a chance to get him. He makes the man on the outside take the long way. He goes down to the one-yard line. Officially 58 yards now in the ball game. The short yardage quarterback, Matt Clark. And right away, tripped up, I believe that was Murray out of the backfield. But Carlson, a run of that distance, should not at all be surprising. He ran for 100 yards against Southern Cal a few weeks ago. He's a great runner. They have gotten away a little bit from the veer as far as uh, Carlson keeping the ball this year because they want to keep the guy healthy. Right now, the short right of unit is in just particularly for that, almost, as Grant Tiap calls it, a special team. give to McAdoo and he is up ended immediately makes maybe a yard O'Brien the man to bring him down O'Brien the all conference nose guard as we look at Grant Taft who features one of the more interesting offenses in all of college football in fact R.C. Slocum yesterday the assistant head coach and defensive coordinator for A&M said hey I'd rather play any other team in the country than prepare for these guys Clark wants to throw, he'll keep it, and is he in? Yes! Matt Clark, touchdown, Baylor! Matt Clark, 5'10", 188 pounds out of Corsicana, a split in, and the tandem quarterback. He was a option quarterback in high school. He comes in on the short yardage unit that was just set up for situations like this, the coaches say this unit has been over 90% sex successful every time they've taken the field. Siler's kick again is good. So the Bears with eight minutes and 42 seconds to go in the first. A 14-0 lead over AM. The Bears making life difficult here at Kyle Field early for AM. Two-yard touchdown run from Clark. The big play, of course, the 58-yard run from Cody Carlson. So Gary Hayes kicks off again. And that is Rod Harris back to receive, brings it out. 15, and he's not going to make it to the 20. Brings it out to the 17-yard line. Now let's go down to Becky Dixon. Becky? For the Berry family from Abilene, Texas, A&M versus Baylor means brother against brother. Now, Greg is a linebacker for the Bears, while his brother, Dean, is a member of the 12-man kickoff squad for the Aggies. With me now are their parents, Mr. and Mrs. Palberry. And Mrs. Berry, how do you decide who you're going to yell for? Well, I, it is tough, but you know, I, you notice I'm wearing buttons for both right. boys, and we support both of them. Are you surprised by the score so far? Definitely. What did the boys say to, this, to each other this week? Well, I think they called each other Monday, and each one of them asked the other one what their game plan was, and neither one of them would tell them. All right, good luck to both of your sons, Corey. <laughs> I'll bet they wouldn't say anything about it. They certainly wouldn't. In high school, I played against my brother, Calvin. Really? And we played against each other uh, three years in a row, and we had uh, two games we matched up, and he scored two touchdowns, I scored two, but one of the great moments in the ball game, our team won, by the way, was when I had a chance to tackle my own brother. <laughs> after all the years of being beat up by him, I came out on top. Second and seven after the three-yard pickup by Roger Vick, and Murray is taken down in a hurry in the backfield. That is big number 57, Ray Berry, the man we were just talking about. The 6'3 senior out of Abilene, all Southwest Conference, the man that Coach Tapp says the second-best linebacker I've ever coached. This 23-year-old man, all Southwest Conference, he's got good size, good speed, Right there, he showed you a bit of his quickness, just coming around the outside on the blitz and taking Kevin Murray down. And if you're wondering who that top linebacker was in Grant Teff's estimation, that would be Mike Singletary, who plays his ball for the Chicago Bears now. Murray going long across the middle, and nobody there. Incomplete pass. A&M's offense stymied again. Baylor's defense comes up with the big play. It was a... Uh, Incomplete pass by Murray. He's now only one of five, total of nine yards. So Craig Stump comes on again. That last pass he threw, there were a number of receivers, but no one was really looking at the ball. 
Stumps kick. That is Everett back to receive at about the 47. Little juke step. Nice job up across the 40 to the 35-yard line of AM. And to get an idea of some of that athletic ability of Thomas Everett, don't you, Lynn? He is only 5'9", but he's a bright player, very intelligent, learned the game extremely well. Grant Taft saw something in him at a very early age and said, this kid's going to be an All-American. Now, in his senior year, he is returning as an All-American. 17-yard pickup. Don't forget, hey, what a game Monday night. The Broncos and the Jets, a couple of clubs who lead their respective divisions. Elway for the Broncos. And I'll tell you, the New York Jets defensive line led by Mark Gaskin will take that as a personal challenge and really go after Elway. Kenny O'Brien should be healthy for the game. Freeman McNeil may be back. He's been injured, of course. Should be a good one. McAdoo, a couple yards. Sammy O'Brien. Hey, we do that again. Sammy O'Brien. Right. <laughs> Where were you, Corey? Stereo. <laughs> Yeah, he came blistering in there, number 90. 6'3", 248 pounds. Gain of two yards. Now, Baylor will use a lot of people. Don't be surprised if you see six, seven different running backs, five, six, seven different receivers going with the single. Back here, that is Murray. And look for the throw, but look out first for the sack. Number 73 for Texas A&M. That's Todd Howard. Seemed like Todd Howard was leading a cavalry charge on this one. Cody Carlson is dropping back on the play. He sets in the pocket. He's really looking to his outside. He's a player jump up in front of his face. That was number 82, Jay Muller. And then Howard comes in low to make the sack. That jump in the air just froze him long enough, Corey, yeah. so that he wouldn't throw the football and move out of the pocket. Howard who hails from Bryan, Texas, right here next to College Station. It's third and 15 after the sack. Howard's third quarterback sack on the year. Carlson throwing, and it is caught. Caught at about the eight-yard line, and that is Leland Douglas. A fine throw to the sideline, and Douglas just brought it in before he stepped out of bounds. 32 yards. Take a look at how much time Cody Collison has as he drops back to pass. A little, excuse me, a half roll. He's got those big linemen giving him all day. His vision of the field is absolutely clear, which allows him to throw a perfect pass to the sideline. And that's one of the toughest passes to throw in football. Leland Douglas out of Beaumont. That is Todd Connor. Tries to turn it up. It's about the four-yard line. Jackie Sherrill. I met, first met Jackie while he was a coach at the University of Pittsburgh. He is a steady, astute coach. He knows what's going on. Right now, he's, he has to feel a good deal of pressure as he did not expect his team to be down by 14 points so early in this ballgame. Baylor's offense continues to churn up the yardage. They rank number three in the nation. Carlson, that's the give to Connor, and Connor is hit hard immediately by number 65, Larry Kelm. Larry Kelm was just in good position. He probably could have done himself a bit better if he had just moved up into that pocket, short yardage situation. You want to play that line of scrimmage as close as you can, not to give them one or two yards down here inside the, inside the five. Third down and two. A&M's defense coming in, ranked number three in the nation, tops in the conference. They're allowing only 214 yards a game. Big third down play. And the Aggies' defense rise to the occasion while they may, but not right now because Carlson says, let's talk things over. So as Carlson heads off to talk to Grant Taft and company, we'll take a timeout as well. Just under five minutes to go in the first quarter here in College Station. Is his or her date? The last time, a few minutes ago, Baylor on third and goal scored as Clark took it in from two yards out. This time, though, Grant Tapp choosing not to go with his tandem offense, that short yardage offense. He's got Carlson in there, quarterback. 
in the I formation, Murray and Connor, third and two. Murray crunching ahead. He is close, but I don't think he scored. The Taylor players say, come on, let's go. Grant Tab, I believe, is sending in the field goal unit. That ball about a look. half yard away, right? I see Matt Clark in there. Ah, they're going to go. What they did, they sent in that short yardage formation with Clark, the ex-option quarterback from high school who fills in on the short yardage situations at the controls. And they give to Charles Perry, I believe, and he has stopped on the fourth down play. Larry Kelm comes through to stop Charles Perry on the fourth and goal play, and that kind of a defensive stand maybe is what AM needs to kind of fire them up and get them rolling a little bit. Well, it's going to be good for the defense because they stopped them, but it's going to be terrible for the offense because the offense is not going to have any room to operate. A great emotional stand for the defense. Can't blame Grant Taft for going for it. His team is having a great deal of success here in the first half. He goes in and gets that touchdown. They could be up by 21. The ball goes over to AM at the one foot line. He got three backs in the ball game. Roger Vick gets the call and he barrels out to about the four yard line. We talked to Roger Vick yesterday, a real friendly fella who, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Lynn, is, is ticketed for the NFL. Jackie told us yesterday this fellow will be playing in the next league pretty soon. He's, he's got all the tools the strength, the speed, power. Right now, the strength and power is behind their big tackle, number 77, Marshall Land. Second and seven. Again, the choice is Roger Vick. How big is Land now, Clint? Well, Land, he's listed in the program as 340 pounds. But in talking with the coaches, they believe <laughs> at this particular moment that big number 77 is more in the area of, shall we say, 378? Ooh. But the interesting thing about Land, at 378, he was tested out to only have 20% body fat. So he is not overweight. Third and three. Which side does he have it? It's close, but I don't think he's there. Couple feet short. So Baylor's defense comes up, stops a and and a and once again, we'll have to punt the ball away. The offense just not clicking. And one problem may be that offensive line that came into the game banged up. You certainly did. Land's got a bruised foot. Got a couple other people that are hampering, are hampered with injuries. So Stump getting a workout today. He pounds it out. Everett, the fair catch at the 45-yard line. Right now, let's head to New York and Jim Lampley. Jim? We'll score from Athens, Georgia, 38-16, dogs over Commodores. Vince Dooley's career record versus Vanderbilt, now 19-1-1. And, and in a game between two of the unpredictable teams in a topsy-turvy conference, Texas Tech, victor over Arkansas last week, leads Rice in the fourth quarter, 28-21, about seven minutes to go. Let's go back to College Station. Hey, Jim, thank you very much. 45-yard line for Bader. Once again, some great field possession. It could be 21-0. It's only 14-0 after a &M came up with a big defensive play to the far sideline. That is David Davis. He makes the grab. About a yard short of the first down. A pickup of nine on the play. And Baylor's offense continues to move the football. They're at the 36-yard line of a &M. Colby Carlson will come up to that line of scrimmage, and if he has a quick pass called, called at the line, he's got receivers spread almost from sideline to sideline. He has a strong enough arm to get the ball out there before the defensive players from Texas A&M can react. Carlson so far, 5 of 6, 126 yards and one touchdown. That's Randy Rutledge. He gets the first down just across the 35-yard line to the Bears. I'm moving the ball. Johnny Holland, the All-American, made the tackle for Texas A&M. A&M's defense is not used to the ball being moved quite this rapidly on them in a football game in a long time. No, they aren't. But as we said earlier, 
with all the formations that Baylor has, it's very difficult on the intellectual level for them to come out and play this ball club. Split back Veer. Carlson. The Veer will pitch it. And Rutledge has nowhere to go. Going to try the other way. Look out. Gets one block. And he's got a couple other guys in front of him. May get back to the line, but doesn't. He is in hard at the 40-yard line. That's a loss of six yards on the play. And the man to stop him there was Alex Morris. So Randy Rutledge give a couple of coaches heart attacks, I would think, on that play, Lynn. Well, certainly, because he also had his, his quarterback, Cody, <laughs> Cody uh, Carlson, out there trying to throw a block to bring him back to the other side. And he threw a, a very good block, took a man down. But when you see your quarterback doing that kind of thing and, and he runs a complicated offense, it really does scare you. Cody Carlson, Baylor's all-time career leader in passing yards and total offensive yards, right now faces a second and 16. Straight drop back. Intended for Matt Clark, could not make the catch, and it flies by Morris, who almost had a chance for the interception off the deflection. Yeah, what, <laughs> what Matt might have been looking at was number 65, Larry Kelm, linebacker, 6'4", 220, and he was just set, waiting to hit Matt. Difference in rushing yardage. Tells the whole story in this ball game. Baylor offense having possessing this football, having the field position, marching it down the field. The two scoring drives, both coming in less than two minutes. Third and 16. Near side, it is not complete. Knocked down there, intended for David Davis. And there is a flag, I believe, on the play. Number two, Jeff Holland. Holly was out there, jumped up in the air. I thought he was going to make a one-handed grab. Looked like he was. We'll find out. Just what No play, dead ball. Delay of game offense. Still third down. 25 second clock and run out. Did not get it off in time. For the quarterbacks, just in case I think most of you I'm probably up. know this, but I'm there are up. small clocks that only go up 25 and count down for the quarterback to see at either end of the stadium. So the five-yard penalty, they'll get the down over again. Third and 21 now. Back at the 45-yard line. Carlson checking off. Big rush off the pass it is incomplete and look out because in came number 73 Todd Howard to really put the rush on Baylor's first punt of the day coming up as the cadets applaud the defensive stand from AM. and again as you can tell they're all standing that's the tradition here the Aggies do not sit down when they watch football here at Kyle Field Jim Mueller to kick. Rod Harris at the 14, drops the football. And it's loose. Who's got it? Baylor. The Bears recover. Rod Harris at the 15, lost the sight of the football. Try to make the center field type catch. And Baylor has the football on the seven yard line. The man to grab it is Scott Works. There is a bit of a wind here that just circles the stadium. And that was a high punt that went straight up and almost looked like a knuckleball, Corey. Came down, Rod signaled a fair catch, stepped up to make it, just went right through his arm. Tragic mistake for this young man. Gives Baylor the ball inside the 10-yard line. You know who actually fell on that ball? Norris Blunt. Norris Blunt. You know him? <laughs> well, I met Norris several years ago, many, many years ago, in the locker room of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The reason why the young man was there is because his father, one of the greatest cornerbacks ever to play, Mel Blunt. It would have been a five-yard illegal substitution penalty against A&M. Penalty is declined, first down by Lerner. That makes some sense. Norris Blunt also a backup cornerback for this team, right. following a bit in his father's footstep. So what Texas A&M could not afford to do, they've just done. 14-0 the score. It should be 21-0. They make all... 
should be 21 nothing. It's 14 nothing, and uh, they've given the ball away to Baylor inside the 10-yard line. A horrible mistake with a minute and 12 to go in the first. Carlson rifles it near side for Ben Baker, and that ball very easily could have been picked off out there by James Flowers, who happened to pick off two of them last week in the game against Houston. In fact, that's the young man who challenged you yesterday on the campus, wasn't it, Lynn? Yeah, he did. He challenged <laughs> me, said he could come out and defend me. And uh, I, of course, uh, you were decided, polite to him. I, was, I decided it would be in my best judgment not to go out there. <laughs> <laughs> Jack and Cheryl up against it right now, hoping his defense can stop another scoring threat. So second and seven. Carlson, fortunate that ball was not intercepted a moment ago. To the end zone for Clark. Overthrew him. Kip Corrington providing coverage there. Corrington, the all-Southwest Conference defensive back and an all-American all academic American. Down here in the goal line, you don't have a lot of room to throw passes. You really, this is where a quarterback really has to use a fine touch. You can't drill every pass. You might not, you might not be catchable by his receivers to the corners. He's going to get the loft of the linebackers and drop it into his receivers. So third and seven. Try it again. Big rush gets it off. It is caught inside the five. That is Murray. He's tackled immediately. That's Corrington in there who hit him hard. They'll give it to him at the three-yard line. Watch it again. A lot of crossing patterns for the Baylor Bears. Cody dropping back, going off his heels. He gets a receiver crossing in front of Murray. And right there, the hit being made. Changing the goal line. Jackie Carroll, who is hoping to get to the 500 mark against the Baylor Bears. Right now, it's not looking good. Terry Seiler on for the kick. It is up and good. 13-yard field goal by Seiler, his sixth on the year. A 19-yard field goal, rather, for Seiler. And it's 17. All right, Corey. All Thank you, fans, Becky. Be careful the, down there. All the fans from Waco look like about 15 people. <laughs> They got a few thousand. We can see some of the green over there, but it's mostly maroon here at Kyle Field. Look out, Murray. Pressure. He's got a man wide open. Rod Harris. And Murray saw the blitz, saw Harris wide open, and just missed him. Had he hit him, that might have been six. It would have been six. Harris was pulling away from the cornerback. Kevin was throwing that from more of a horizontal position than a vertical one, back on his heels. The blitz is coming in. He has some faith that his receiver is going to be open. You see him trying to get it off. He can't follow through with the ball, and the ball just sails on him. Look how wide open Harris is here. You can bet that they will come back to that play and try and take advantage of it. Man-to-man -man coverage. Second and 10. And Murray, who comes in as almost a 61% completion for the 61 percent completion rate today one of six there's timeout right now AM AM calling it Murray comes to the sideline Jackie Sherlow's over there along with Lynn Amity Kevin Murray we had a chance to talk to him yesterday an impressive young man in fact a great athlete uh, in baseball as well in fact uh, played for the Milwaukee Brewers in their rookie league several years ago back in 82 as a matter of fact the center fielder he's a very determined young man when he had that foot injury had four pins put in two of which were removed and two will stay in permanently the coaches did not expect him to be back at spring practice he gets out there, comes in in spring practice, and we have a new offensive coordinator. I have to learn the system. Got in, learned the system. They came back that next year, said, I'm ready to play. They said, we're not going to start you and have you out here hurt again. We're going to have you split time. He split time, four or five games in the season. He just took over again. Second and ten, believe it or not, A&M, as the final seconds in the first quarter approach, still looking for their first first down of the day. Keith Woodside. Manages about three yards. That'll set up a third and seven or eight situation. So the Aggies offense continues to struggle. 
We're through with one quarter at Kyle Field, and Baylor is up. 17 points. You can see turnovers, a big reason why. Murray zips it out to Rod Bernstein. For Bernstein, his first catch of the day. Bernstein, the club's top receiver, and in fact, the conference's top receiver with 28 receptions coming in. There you see the turnover situation. One fumble led to a touchdown. Another fumble led to a field goal. And that, my friends, that uh, throw from Murray to Bernstein is A&M's first, first down of the day. Good for 12 yards. 12 yards. See the stats there from the first quarter, just dominated by the Baylor offensive unit. They've been on the field most of the game so far. And off, Vic pounds for a couple. And just to continue to give you... Give you an idea how unusual this game is. I'll tell you that as soon as we hear from Becky Dixon. Becky. Corey, I just talked to the Baylor right halfback, Randy Rutledge. He, of course, scored one of their touchdowns earlier. I asked him what had been the key to the success they had had in moving the ball. He gives all the credit to the offensive line. He said he hadn't seen them miss a block yet. He also said he had never seen the Bears' defense hit any harder than they're doing here today. That offensive line, they got some hosses. Here comes that defense, puts his eye. First down of the game. 14 yard pickup. Murray to Woodside. Woodside and AM Tim finally getting some offense going. AM not playing the kind of football game they're accustomed to playing in terms of scoring. They've scored 35 points in the first game, first quarter of five games and held their opponents only 14 for five games. Have given up 17 so far to Baylor. To fire and he does incomplete Everett supplying the coverage on Rod Bernstein. Thomas Everett, the All-American, the man that AM wants to keep the ball away from, trying to send the flow a different direction. He is that good for the scores around the country. 17-0, early second quarter. AM. Their offense finally showing a little spark here. It's second and ten. Again, the ball smack dab in the middle of the football field. Murray hits Tony Thompson to the 44-yard line. Thompson brought down immediately there by Aaron Grant, the big middle linebacker out of Dallas. The book on Tony Thompson is that he is a young man with great ability. Great talent. They expect a lot of things from him. But as of yet, he really hasn't broken out. By broken out, I mean he just hasn't shown all of that talent, put it all together yet. Okay, it's third and three. Can AM keep it going after two first downs on this drive? Look at the tremendous block he gets right here. That was number 50, Matt Wilson. It came back, peeled off, and got the defender. Then it's Kevin Murray realizing he can't get downfield to find the receiver with a pass. Just takes off and run and slides for a first down. Five-yard pickup for Murray. Robert Waters, the man who had the shot at Murray in the backfield, number 44. Woodside in motion. Murray to fire. It's complete to Tony Thompson at the 28-yard line. And suddenly, you see the confidence growing in Murray. The passes seem to zip a little better. Balls are zipping to the outside. His receivers are running the good routes. It was their intention coming into the ball game to keep the passes to the outside, away from the All-American safety, number 27, Thomas Everett. So Tony Thompson coming up with two catches, key catches in this drive. They are going to measure for the first down. There's a good look at Kevin Murray on the sideline. When Tony caught that pass, his feet were beyond the first down marker. But it looked as if the ball was not, and he went out of bounds. So it could be marked anywhere. It could, depending on where the officials were looking, it could be short or it could be just beyond that first down marker. Whichever, it is very close. 
marking it short. You see him here grabbing Grab the chain. Grabbing the chain about a, what, a short of the first down. 10 inches looks like. It's always marked where the ball went, goes out of bounds, not necessarily where the player goes out of bounds. 28-yard line. Grant Taft, who last year received several Southwest Conference Coach of the Year honors, as did Jackie Sherrill, as a matter of fact. Let's head down to, uh, to Becky Dixon very quickly. All right. We'll do it in a moment. But first, see what happens on this second and one situation. A little play action, Murray, lots of time, just floats it out for Burks. Dixon. Corey, on Baylor's last offensive series, Kobe Florence tied in, re-injured an ankle that he had sprained last week against SMU. It's very doubtful he will be back at all today. David Bell will be in on Baylor's next possession. Okay, thank you, Becky. There was a flag on that play. The officials are conferring as to what the call is going to be, but that was a great catch by Bernstein on the play. Very gutsy call by Jackie Sherrill on the A&M offense. It's third down, one yard to go. Instead of going for the safe play, they go up top. Oh. See there, Bernstein making the great catch and with tight coverage. Bernstein, another AM player who is ticketed for the pros, 6'3, 230 pounds. The penalty was against Baylor. The penalty would not have been as long as the play, so they return down the penalty and keep the play. Exactly. So from the 10 yard line. A&M with four first downs in the game, all of them on this drive. Some movement on the line. The Baylor players pointing to Fontenot, number 67. Baylor moves, or A&M rather, moves back. And I think it's going to be against A&M. Movement on the line. So we step it back five yards to the 15. Ball start, offense, the first down. One that can see where it is here, Lynn. One of the linemen down there. It is Fontenot. Number 67. 67. Fontenot playing right guard. So, first and 15 for Kevin Murray and company. Complete to Shea Walker at the five-yard line. Jay Walker's first grab of the day. Anthony Coleman, the man there to make the tackle for Baylor. Walker and Bernstein exchange high fives. A&M's fired up, and obviously, early in the second quarter, 17 points doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. Very interesting on that last play that Baylor blitzed. A&M caught him in that blitz. Both teams will blitz a lot today. Murray again fires. It is good. Touchdown to Bernstein. Kevin Murray. The quick rocket to the corner of the end zone. Right near the goal line. And Rod Bernstein is there. Look at that pass. It just goes a straight line, no arc on it. He throws it to a tight corner. Tight coverage on Rod. Maintains that concentration. Extra point is good. Seven points for the Aggies. Rod Bernstein, his third touchdown catch of the day. And the Aggies are seven points closer here at Kyle Field. Listen to the heartbeat. Station, Corey McFerrin, Lynn Swan, and Becky Dixon. We got a 17-7 ball game. And Kevin Murray just hit Rod Bernstein with the touchdown. Now it is the Aggies uh -oh. who are kicking off. And when they kick off, who kicks off for them? Uh-oh, we're talking about the 12th man. Right here, first time in the ball game. The 12th man. Some 200 students, non-football players, try out for this squad. Some 70,000 all waving those 12-man towels all around the stadium. Of those 200 or so players who try out, some 40 are kept. 
They practice every single day with all the scholarship players. They work out hard day in and day out for their opportunity that only comes on Saturday afternoons at home. And as Jackie Sherrill told us yesterday, we went full speed with the 12th man squad once. We'll never do it again. <laughs> they were that rough. problem with enthusiasm. None whatsoever. Take a look at that last scoring drive. 12 plays and 80 yards. Very strong effort by the Aggies to get back in this ball game. Those 12th men players are like cheerleaders on that bench too. They are. In fact, uh, Rod Harris, the split end, told us yesterday that uh, it really fires up the players to have those guys down there hooting and hollering and cheering you along. From the I formation, Baylor, first man through. Gain of about two yards. Sammy O'Brien makes the stop. Now, what the AM Aggies need right here is for their defense to come through. Put together a stand here with 11 minutes to play in the second period to stop. The offense led by Cody Carlson. Connor in there along with McAdoo, the split backfield. The give is to Connor, looking for a hole, tries the left side and slides through to the 32-yard line. That play is a great example of the variation that Baylor is presenting to Texas A&M. They ran that play to the right side, tried to get the flow of the defense to move to the right, then gave it to the back who was cutting against the grain, just looking for any kind of a hole to pick his way and go downfield. So again, we have that tandem offense situation. Two yards or less at third and two. Carlson, though, is in the ball game. And the backs, as you can see, are split. Callen in there. Kell makes the play. They did not make it. It's they are short down. by a yard. Fourth down. No way. So Baylor will have to punt, and you can sense the momentum here at Kyle Field beginning to shift. Second punt of the day for Mueller, as you can see, does not wear the shoe. Short kick bounding around about the 33-yard line. A good bounce for Baylor. And it's out of bounds at about the 25-yard line. So A&M's offense will see if they can't repeat what they did a few moments ago. It's 17-7 Bears. The Texas Aggies looking for their 12th consecutive win here at Kyle Field. They give there to Roger Vick up the middle for a couple. In fact, the Yankees have not lost here at Kyle Field since October of 84, and the team to beat them on that Saturday afternoon was the Baylor Bears. Baylor really has handled these guys pretty well the past few seasons. They've won three of the last four at Kyle Field, six of the last eight overall, including a 20 to 15 decision last year at Waco. Looking for Rod Bernstein. He got a good idea of the kind of gun he has. He had some pressure there. Drifting to his right. Just fired one downfield. Hoping his receiver would get there in time. Two, two things that happened in the ball game so far with Rod Harris dropping the punt uh, for the fumble and Vix losing the ball also on the run for a fumble. Players do that. They tend to get a little more conservative. For instance, Harris could have come up, maybe made a catch on that punt until they could bounce in for extra yards. Vicks is going to be a little more conservative running, trying to protect the football. Third and nine from the 26. Again, Murray looks, fires, and connects for Harris. He's across midfield. He could go. 20, 15. He is stopped at the seven-yard line by Ron Francis. 
just spoke about Rod Harris. He comes through on cue. Murray to Harris, good for 68 yards, caught from behind by Ron Harris. Trying to get his team back into this ball game, trying to make up for a previous error. He comes across on a crossing pattern just inside. His book says that he will make the tough catch on the center. He's looking back, sees he's got pressure. I don't think he saw number 11, Ron Francis, coming over, but we just got an indication of just how fast Francis is as he closed on Rod Harris to make that tackle. Francis, top player, yeah, he's all a good one. best conference last year. All conference, he and Everett make up one of the best secondaries in the country, along with other fine players back there. That was Roger Vick inside the five to about the three-yard line. So, big third down play. Good for 68 yards. Murray to Harris, and very quickly, a and inside the five-yard line here with under eight minutes to go in the half, and they can be within three if they score here. Very important emotionally to this ball club to get in and to get within three with a touchdown here. Short. He's at about the one yard line and there's a flag away from the play. Line line judge called that. There's going to be something on the team, probably alignment. You see Keith, Kevin, excuse me, indicating offsides. And that's the call. Against the Baylor Bears. You get down, you get down there tight. You're on a short yardage situation, the goal line. You can't afford to give up an inch. You're trying to fight the whole time. The linemen will come up and they'll line up on the ball and if one player lines up off the other players lining up off him will be offside so take a look he goes up in the air Vex about four yards from the goal line and gets within one they'll take the penalty i believe save the down so they'll have second down instead of third down exactly second and goal here the ball at the one half yard line offside defense Penalty declined. No nope. third down. No, they don't. I'm not sure I understand that. Well, they may have just felt that if they move the ball half the distance to the goal line, it'd still be further away than where the ball is now. They'll take their chances having one less down. Murray, touchdown. And it pays off. Murray with the touchdown brings AM within three. And as you know, the Aggies can kiss their respective dates whenever they score. And I think we just caught a tail end of one of those kisses a moment ago. <laughs> Another one of the traditions here at Kyle Field, College Station. Scott Slater is on. Nick is up and good. It's 17 to 14. Baylor leads by three, and I think somebody's showing off for us now. Well, that's one of the core, <laughs> one of the members of the core after the touchdown. Whenever the Aggies score, you kiss your date, your wife, your girlfriend, whoever you're with. You take another look at that touchdown. So, with 7-16 in the ball game, the Aggies come back to score to make it a 14-17 ball game. into a frenzy that towels all over the place. The 12th man kickoff team is on. Again, the scoring drive took him over two minutes to get there, and Kevin Murray took it across from one yard out. He had thrown the touchdown pass just minutes before to Bernstein. So it's a 17-14 ball game. The kickoff, and it is out of bounds at about the eight or nine yard line. Let's go down now to Becky Dixon. Becky? Corey, as you pointed out earlier, one of the more pleasurable of the Aggie traditions is the kissing after every score. Now, we just saw Tab and Jodine kissing. The Aggies take this job very seriously. Every night before a home game, they hold not only a yell practice, but a three-minute kissing practice as well. And, Jodine, that has to be more fun than study hall, I guess. Oh, it's a lot more fun. You learn a lot, too. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to ask you about this. But, Corey, I think uh, you know that in the leaner years of Aggie days, uh, never let it be said that they're not adaptable. When they weren't scoring as many touchdowns, they kissed after every first down. <laughs> well, they're, they're very that, smart. <laughs> well, with every first down today with the kind of team that uh, Jackie Sherrill has here, I think they'd, uh, they'd need a lot of chapstick or something after a few quarters. Scott Slater will do it again after. 
to Ben Rance. I'll tell you, all that kissing make, makes a, a bachelor feel like he's kind of out of it without a girlfriend here. From the 35-yard line, Franklin, the man to make the stop for the 12th man squad. Don't forget Monday night. The Broncos and the Jets, Monday night football. And one player that you will see in action for the Jets is a former AM great, Johnny Hector, who last week, as a matter of fact, rushed for 143 yards, his best game as a pro. John Elway and company, the Broncos take on the Jets. Should be a goodie. Broncos, along with the Bears, the only undefeated team left in the NFL. Seven minutes and ten seconds to go. A&M crowd still whooping it up here. Cody Carlson, your quarterback for Baylor. Back into the tailback, but the give is to Connor. To the 28-yard line. Steve Bullitt nails him for A&M. And him back in this ball game because their defense has really turned things around. They've stopped the Bears in their last drive, had them punt the football, had pretty good field position. Right now, the charge going to do the same thing. It'll be second and six. Carlson audibling. They give first man through that is McAdoo crashes to the 30 or the 31. Johnny Holland in there along with Todd Howard. One of the things that the Aggies have to do here is give Cody Carlson false reads. Make him think they're going to blitz and then not blitz. Get all their people back to cover the option. Then when he thinks they aren't going to blitz and he calls a play, bring a few people just to try and shake them up a bit. Three for Baylor. Douglas in motion. The give, no, it's the veer, and that's McAdoo. Tries to turn it up, he is close to the first down, but I think he has been stopped short by a yard. He has to get that ball just inside the marker, which is on the 34-yard line. Players. a &M players are shaking their heads, but uh, I think they'll bring out the chain to check it out. Number 27, Chet Brooks, one of their key players, a cornerback in that secondary, was giving it a very casual, they didn't get it, didn't have quite the emotion of, or the confidence of an all-out right. stop. Well, he... See why? He was very right. Close. <laughs> he was right. So the towels, a familiar sight at College Station, are out again. You're the game's boy. Michigan down in the first half, as you saw. Notre Dame, a big winner today. Nebraska rolling. Tight game with Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Oh, Southern Cal. Did you check that one out? 3 0. Yeah, 3 0. But you just have to have more points when the game is over. <laughs> That's the key. That's the key. Jim Mueller. The Bears punter, kind of a line shot. Harris at the 24, and he's brought down immediately there. So A&M on offense from the 24-yard line with five minutes and 20 seconds to go in the first half. To the mid-50s and two of A&M's biggest stars, John David Crow, All-American halfback and Heisman Trophy winner, and Jack Pardee, an All-American fullback. They combine under legendary coach Paul Bear Bryant to lead the Aggies to the conference title in 1956. In fact, we had a chance last night to uh, have a little dinner with John David Crow, who now is the associate athletic director here at Texas A&M. One of my heroes. I used to watch him play football for the San Francisco 49ers. The only Heisman Trophy winner in Texas A&M history. Murray all 
finds the time. Hits Bernstein at the 30-yard line. Rod Bernstein, right here from Bryan, Texas, 6'3", 230 pounds. He caught that touchdown pass early in the second quarter. He's as good as they come. They call him a tight end, but he lines up anywhere. Yeah, they, what did the coach say? We call him a U-back sometimes? No. <laughs> yeah, U-back because yeah. We'll, we'll use you whenever we, we need, need you. <laughs> <laughs> Second and four. Matt Gurley in the ball game for the first time. A gain of three. Bernstein, by the way, four catches for 42 yards and a touchdown. Had that big cotton ball, you may remember, last year. Six catches, 108 yards, kind of set the stage for this year. Third and two. Murray fires. First down at about the 40-yard line. That's number 80, Tony Thompson. Going to the outside, trying to stay away from the center of the field. Going there only when they have to. And his five straight successful third down conversions. Whatever they were doing wrong in the first period, aside from just making the obvious mistakes in, the, in terms of turnovers, the Aggie offense has corrected it, putting together a very good drive in this ball game. Backs in the eye, the pitch to Woodside. This guy can run. Tries to crash through on the right side, gets to about the 43 yard line, where he's stopped there by Kevin Marsh, the big. Left in out of San Antonio. Grand tap. Trying to get his defensive unit to settle down. They did fairly well on that last play, stringing him out to the outside, not giving them a big hole on the inside until help came to the outside. Four-yard gain on Woodside. Look out, Waters. Sacks Murray back at the 31-yard line. He was coming. That is the third sack of the day. Waters nails him. You re may remember about five minutes earlier in this ball game, he had a chance to nail him and missed him. Sure did. This time we see Kevin. He's looking downfield. Waters comes from the outside. He should have been able to see Waters and get rid of that football. Had his head slightly turned to his left side. His back was to the player, though. You may recall last year, Waters' interception on the Baylor 13 with 12 seconds to play sealed the 20 the 15 win for the Bears. So third and 16, Murray firing. He's got his man at about the 47-yard line, Shea Walker. And some cross signals there between Walker and Rod Bernstein. Walker makes the grab, the grab, the catch, but Bernstein was coming across at the same point of the reception, and he jumped up in the air to avoid the contact, but it was just enough to bring Shea Walker down. So he was tackled by one of his own players. That's why he looked a little miffed because of that and the fact that he's two yards short of the first down. Had it not happened, I'm sure he felt like he could have maneuvered for an extra yard or two. There's a timeout in the field with two minutes and 24 seconds to go in the half. We got a ball game at College Station. McFerrin, Lynn Swan, and Becky Dixon with you. Baylor a three-point lead. Less than two and a half to go. Craig Stump on the punt for AM. His fifth punt of the ball game. First of the quarter. It's a deep one. And Everett grabs it at the eight-yard line where Baylor will take over. A 43-yard punt. Right now, let's pay a visit to the Baylor campus in Waco. Through the years, Baylor University has offered students from around the world a high standard of value-based Christian education. Today, Baylor proudly continues its traditions of moral awareness, academic excellence, and individual achievement. Baylor University, a place to meet the challenges of our times, a place to learn, a place to grow. football the eight yard line and is Douglas in motion Carlson with a great first quarter has been quiet here early in the second and is Murray tries to straddle the sideline to about the 15 yard line gain of six on the play sets up a second and four 
If you've just joined us, the Bears got on the board very quickly. Carlson to Randy Rutledge. He's came for 52 yards. Jackie Sherrill, I'm sure, was stunned to see that. A few minutes later, it was Matt Clark, a two-yard run for the touchdown. After a long pickup by Carlson of 58 yards, Siler added a field goal. And then finally in the second quarter, two straight touchdowns by AM to make it a 17-14 ball game. As Charles Perry bangs through the left side, close to first down yardage. Charles Perry, incidentally, the only player on this Baylor club to come from Bryan, Texas. There are four players on the AM squad from Bryan, including uh, Bernstein, the outstanding tight end. And Bryan, Texas is just over there. <laughs> we can see it from where we are, upstairs in the uh, broadcast position. It was, in fact, the first down for the Bears. We got 2.01 to go in the first half. Baylor up by only a field goal at the 19-yard line. Perry to the 23-yard line. Perry last week did not play in the SMU game with an ankle sprain. He has been used sparingly so far today. Todd Howard gets credit for the tackle on Perry on that last play. It would seem after the first quarter and the Baylor Bears having scored two touchdowns each in less than two minutes. That so far in this quarter, when they've had the football, they've attempted to really push the ball straight ahead, use that big offensive line, maybe trying to wear down the defense of a &M just a bit before this half is over. going on. Carlson seemed to freeze in the middle of the play perhaps because he saw the flag. Oh, it's too much time. I don't know if it's too much time, but what happened there... And a personal foul, I believe, on Holland for hitting it. Number 11, Holland. They're out there rushing. I didn't hear a whistle. I didn't see a flag go up if they stopped the clock. Now watch what Carlson does. He just tucks right there as if signaling he's down, but that doesn't mean anything to the players at that point. He's just kneeling, bending over the ball. He gets hit. That should not be a penalty. Shouldn't you always complete the play? I, you know, you should always complete the play. I mean, if he decides he doesn't want to get hit, and he says, you know, I surrender, this play is dead, he drops down to the ground. He just tucks right there. That shot was... I think you're right. A strange call. Personal foul after the ball was dead according to what we just heard from the referee it was delay of game on Baylor five yards and then Holland did not hear the whistle 15 yards I you know <laughs> certainly I think if a player is in the midst of a battle a heated contest you call that kind of play or the whistle is blown because of a delay of game there's always a chance that a player won't hear that whistle all right Carlson comes back everything looks like this play is happening you can't take a chance that the flag is against or a whistle has been blown just because of the actions of a ball player and the hit was not a brutal hit. It was just to the chest. I don't agree with the call. They should not have called it. Bears with the first down on the 33-yard line. Carlson going long for his man Clark and he's got it at the 37-yard line. Wow. With less than a minute to go, we're down to 47 seconds. Clark, a 30-yard reception from Carlson. Clark Carlson's favorite target. Here we go. Coming on the heels of what I think has to be a, the contra most controversial play of the game so far. Personal foul. Clark beat Flowers, and that could be a very, very big play before this game is over. Less than 46 seconds to go. Carlson is hit by Holland this time, fair and square. And I'm sure Holland had a little bit of resentment when he made that hit. Holland will jump out say, and look at the official and say, now, now call a penalty on this play. The play was in, in force, legal hit. He hit him chest high with a little more force than he hit him when he was just standing there. It looked like he had a few things to say after the play, too. Yeah, well, it won't be the last one. That's right. Holland, a legitimate uh, Butkus Award candidate, very fine player at All-American. Texas A&M, we've enjoyed our stay here at College Station, a beautiful, beautiful campus, and right now, 
Let's take a look at Texas A&M and College Station. 150 years after its founding, frontiers are still being explored in the Lone Star State and certainly at Texas A&M. For students and teachers, frontiers are those of the mind, like the universe, constantly expanding. For researchers, new horizons are searched on land in finding better ways to feed a hungry world. Beneath the sea in secrets guarded by centuries. And beyond our planet, probing mysteries not yet gleaned. At Texas A&M, a new frontier simply means a new idea. Baylor had taken the time out. They have none remaining for the half. There are 27 seconds to go. It's a 17-14 ball game. The Bears in front by a field goal. Ball at the 42-yard line. Fans are screaming and, of course, on their feet. Carlson calls signals. Fires it for Douglas. It is out of bounds. Number 10, Kip Corrington, safety for this Texas A&M team right there on the ball, making sure there was no catch there. Corrington, who uh, stands only 5'11", 170 pounds, that academic All-American, as we mentioned earlier. 3.9 uh, GPA. Yeah, three, what was that class? That they, the only it class was, uh, the English rhetoric prior to the 14th century. And I, I had a conversation with Kip, and he seemed very much to me up to date on what was happening back in the uh, English rhetoric before the 14th century. I can't understand a B in that situation, but nonetheless, there's only B ever. 22 seconds to go. Bader puts it up. It is caught at the 15-yard line. That is David Davis. Big catch and stops the clock as he goes out of bounds with 16 seconds to go. Carlson impressive here as we finish the first half. Baylor a chance to get on the board again, a 26-yard pickup. So now Baylor in excellent position. If they decide to go for a field goal, they have no more timeouts. So whatever they do, if they decide to throw a pass here, they're going to throw it out of bounds to stop the clock. They can't afford to run the football, I don't believe, Corey, and still get their field goal unit on the field in time to kick. Look for another pass. 16 seconds to go. That's Perry in motion. Carlson puts it up immediately to the end zone. It is caught, but I don't think he's in bounds. No. He stepped out of the end zone. That is number 13, John Simpson, the sprinter, a split-in sprinter. Made the catch, but didn't get the feet in. Well, you see here, he'll go up in the air to try and make this catch, but he's not hit. And he goes backwards, and he's bicycling, and mm. one foot steps out of bounds first. If he hadn't hitched up there in the air, just let those feet come down, it might have been a touchdown. Terry Siler made a 20-yard field goal in the first quarter. And 11 seconds to go. We'll try it from 32 yards out. Matt Clark, the holder. It is up and... Good. So Sider connects on his second field goal of the day. 32 yards is the count. So with just six seconds to go here in the first half, Baylor extends its lead to 20 to 14. And Simpson, I get the feeling a more experienced receiver, a, a fellow like a Lynn Swan, for example, although there aren't too many around, would have been able to get those feet in the end zone. Well, he knew he was close to that sideline. He jumps up in the air for a pass that's underthrown. And in a situation like that, the underthrown pass is good. It is so tough to defend. So now when he stops, slows his momentum down, goes up in the air and makes his catch, what does he do is just bring both feet straight down instead of bicycling up in the air. A receiver, when he goes up in the air close to the sideline, has got to learn how to sacrifice his body a bit, take the hard fall, but in order to get those feet in bounds. Simpson, an NCAA All-American for his part in uh, the 400 meter relay team for Baylor. He's got the speed Ooh. right there. You see, if he just almost got that left leg down, didn't he? Sure, he almost got it down in time, but you know, when you're so close, you can't depend on the almost. You, you, you sacrifice yourself a bit. So Baylor settles for three. They have a six-point lead. The squib kick bounding around the 24-yard line. And for A&M, that was Tony Jones who picked it up, ran it back a few yards. There's still a couple of ticks left on the clock. Obvious reason for the squib kick is that then it has to be returned before the Baylor Bears get down there and recover it themselves. 
They pick it up, the clock starts, and you run it out, but he was tackled. They quickly call a timeout in order to save those two seconds on the clock. Hail Mary full of grace. Throw a pass, make a touchdown, and tighten the race. <laughs> two seconds to go. I don't think they're going to do it as Murray goes down on one knee, and that is it for the first half. We've seen a wild first half, as we anticipated. 20 to 14, your score. The Bears are up by six. They got off to a 17-point lead. A&M came storming back, and the Bears go to halftime with the lead, 20 to 14. And Chicago Bears. <laughs> Two seconds to go. I don't think they're going to do it as Murray goes down on one knee, and that is it for the first half. We've seen a wild first half, as we anticipated. 20 to 14, your score. The Bears are up by six. They got off to a 17-point lead. A&M came storming back, and the Bears go to halftime with the lead, 20 to 14. And Chicago Bears helping to make that presentation. John David Crow, a former Heisman Trophy winner from Texas A&M. Both of these gentlemen are with me right now. Now, both of you played here at A&M during the 1950s under a coach named Bear Bryant. What are your special memories of that time and of the Bear? Well, I was a, a year ahead of John David. I was a freshman here when Coach Bryant came, so I was just with him three years. But uh, go from uh, a team that, that won one football game to being undefeated my senior year, seeing the transformation of, the, of that group and, and the friendships we developed here, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of tradition and friendships in this school. What about your memories of that time, John David? Well, the thing that I remember most, I guess, is the fact that it was a very tough time in our lives, I think, because Coach Bryant was a tough football coach. But I think that caused us to win, and I think that caused us to become very, very close, and we'll always be very close to each other. Do you still carry the traditions of Texas A&M with you? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, it, you know, of course, it's, uh, you know, to talk about A&M being one big fraternity. At this point, about 33,000 student fraternity, and it's even more so when you're part of an athletic group. The time you spend on the field together and the sweating and the heartaches and the joys, you, you carry that on. And, of course, John and myself and our teammates in Pro Bowl, we had a chance to get together through the years. And it, it, it is a lot of tradition, and the friendships even makes it special. Now, you're a scout now for the Green Bay Packers. Are you doing a little work out here this afternoon? Uh, well, you tell the Saggies and Bears together, uh, they, they about cornered the talent market in the conference. David, I know you especially have to be happy about the way things are going at the Southwest Conference right now at for Texas A&M. Well, yeah, we've been very fortunate that we won four uh, Southwest Conference championships or shared in them last year, and, and which was football was one, obviously. We played in the Cotton Bowl, and then we were, tra we're co champions of the, uh, the basketball, and we won the baseball, and won the women's tennis. So, so we're excited about it, and I think that our I think our programs are a little better this year than they were last year. So we're, we're very, very excited about it. All right, congratulations to both of you gentlemen. Thanks for stopping to talk. And we'll be back with more halftime activities from College Station, Texas, right after this. Stay with us, Texas A&M and Aggie.
at Kyle Field. As you can see, the Baylor Bears up by six points. It's 20 to 14. Hello again, everybody. Corey McFerrin along with Lynn Swan. And Lynn, we've seen a heck of a first half. When we first started this ball game, we said, hey, we're going to see some wild plays, explosive offense. We've seen it. We've seen a lot of points. We've seen some mistakes also that set up some great plays. And I'm frankly surprised that the Aggies made so many mistakes in the first half. In fact, the very first touchdown for Baylor was set up by an Aggie fumble. And that touchdown was a Carlson throw to Randy Rutledge, and he just simply takes off. Yeah, there was a fumble. They had good field position. Uh, they were relaxed, but what happened on this play was just great downfield blocking. You see it once again, number 51, John Attix, the center, is downfield throwing blocks all over the place as Randy Rutledge turns in a 52-yard performance, and it's a 52-yard pass play, but more like a lateral pass and all run. Now Baylor's second touchdown set up by a 58-yard run by Cody Carlson. Matt Clark at the controls here in the short yardage situation. Cody Carlson did an excellent job reading that bear. The short yardage team came in. They'd run two plays. They were not successful. Then Matt stays in there, sprints to the outside. The old high school quarterback comes through. Then Siler hit a field goal, a 20-yard field goal, made it 17-0. Then second quarter, here comes a and &M. Kevin number, Murray here will hit Rod Bernstein. Number 29, Bernstein lines up everywhere on the football field, in the backfield, at flanker, and sometimes split out, makes a great catch in the corner. Then it's Murray again. This time he will keep it himself, and it's a 17-14 ball game. Kevin Murray had been leading his team down the field with pin, uh, pinpoint passing, trying to avoid the mistakes. They found themselves in the second quarter, came back to make it a three-point ball game, and it wasn't until the end of the second half that Bear, very similar as you see a and right there within 85 yards of the Baylor Bears and in the end of the first quarter it looked like Baylor was going to run away with it and put up a Miami kind of game uh, like we saw last week against West Virginia but they fought back uh, the A&M defense came back they stopped Cody Carlson from making the touchdowns on the quick strikes so it's Baylor and a of 19 performance, 180 yards and a touchdown in the first half. And if you recall, he got off to a horrible start, Lynn. He was like one for six to begin the game. It seemed as if he was trying to force things, trying to make everything happen all on his own. And any time you play against a well-coached and disciplined team, most people aren't going to be able to make that kind of action happen unless they get help from the entire unit. Murray, of course, not the only quarterback who shined in the first half for the Baylor Bears. Their signal caller, Cody Carlson, put up uh, some pretty impressive numbers as well. He started out, conversely, very hot in the beginning, slowed down, and then came back with an impressive drive at the end of the first half to set up that field goal. In the end, he's 9 for 16 and 193 yards and one touchdown. He also uh, rushed three times for a total of 47 yards. He was sacked a couple times. As you recall, though, the biggest play of the first half, probably for Cody Carlson, was that 58-yard run that set up the Matt Clark touchdown. That was a thing of beauty. It was a great play, reading that defense, deciding to keep the ball on the option because that is what the defense gave him, and he used his speed, ran straight downfield. A couple of things, obviously, are going to change here, I think, in the second half after the coaches have talked to their players, and you see there Jackie Sherrill coming in probably telling his unit we've got to play tighter defense not give up the big play because they gave up the big plays in the first half on the other side I think it's pretty obvious that Jackie Sherrill's offense has been going to the sideline for most of the pass plays I think the defense for Baylor is going to tee off on that a little bit more try and put more pressure on Kevin Murray and then try and run a more controlled offense here in the second half there's Taft Brad Taft, now the winningest coach in Bears history as we begin the second half. A&M the kickoff. McAdoo lets it float through the end zone. The 12th man getting its job done in good style here this afternoon. You know, if, if you came to a football game here at A&M and you didn't know about the 12th man, it wouldn't take you long to figure it out. Just the way they go out there, the intensity, they're jumping, they're diving it around, the energy, it's incredible to see them on the field. But it's a, it's a great move. There are so many players that just don't want to be on special teams. Coaches will tell you, I have a player who runs a 4-4 and a player who runs a 5-flat. But the 5-flat flat player always gets down to the kickoff first because he wants to be there. They have a unit everybody wants to be there. One of the factor, too, it saves the regular frontline players who may participate in special teams from injury. Cody Carlson at the controls for Baylor. This is Murray. 
He said, let's try a different direction, but he had no option there as AM buries him. Larry Kelm leads the charge. In the first half, I said the defense of Texas AM was going to try and give Baylor some false reads. That was one of them right there. They lined up and it looked like they were short the man on the outside. So Cody Carlson comes up, he calls a play at the line of scrimmage, he decides to take the play to the outside. And the defensive line just shifted when the ball was snapped to their left, Cody's right, and have all their players in position for it. Second and eight. Carlson wants to go up top, hits Murray, but he's lucky if he makes it back to the line of scrimmage. In fact, I think he lost a couple. Roper, 83, John, ran the play extremely well, there for the stop. So the defense for the Aggie score just comes out, made their adjustments, and it shows very quickly, stopping them on the first drive, first two plays. Ever since that goal line stand in the first half, when they came up big to stop Baylor on a fourth down play and get the ball back for the offense, a and defense has played considerably different. Fires it up, going to be picked off, I think, and it is by a and That's number 15, James Flowers. Well, the young man who challenged me yesterday comes through for his team. That ball just floated in the air. I, di I didn't really think he was throwing it in that short area. He had a receiver that took off going deep for Flowers, reading the pass in the air, hung tight in his territory. You see, he goes up. That's an excellent catch he makes right there. James Flowers. He also is from Bryan, Texas. Had two interceptions last week. In fact, ran one back 25 yards for a touchdown. So a good break for AM. First and 10 on a 40 yard line. That's Vic pounding it up. You see flags all over the place. I believe, Corey, this has to be their best field position of the day to start a drive. They've been backed up pretty good. They had a drive, I think, one touchdown drive was 76 yards. The other touchdown was of substantial yardage, 64. I'm going to walk the other direction right now, however. Two offensive players moving at the same time without getting reset. Still first down, illegal shift. Illegal shift, they push it back to the 45-yard line. Five-yard penalty, it'll be first and 15. We've just begun the third quarter. James Flowers' interception gives A&M great field position. Murray to Woodside, gonna be picked off, no, and that's Thomas Everett, number 27, and he should have had that football. And he came up, he was in the great position for it, if he had picked it off, he would have been an express mail delivery into the end zone. No kidding. See him as he steps right up in here. Now, right now, look at look at the field, how much darker it is. There's a big shadow that is now creeping, has crept uh, all the way across to the far hash mark in the field. So players coming out of that sunlight are going to have to make an adjustment with their eyes, as you see it there, crossing the center. Everett, Baylor's interception leader with four. Would like to have had five. Here Murray going to take off a big, big opening. A nice twisting move to the 37-yard line. Picks up about seven yards on the play. Ray Berry, the outstanding linebacker out of Abilene, makes the stop. He told you his brother is on the 12th man unit for Texas A&M. And don't think Ray Berry wasn't looking for this. Knowing that this young man, Kevin Murray, will take off and run, he was probably just hanging in the center of the field to pick him up if he did that. He decided to run, and instead of picking up the first down, it's third and eight. Harris, Bernstein, and Walker, the top of your screen, all looking to get the ball from Murray. He's rolling out, giving directions, so Walker is incomplete. Covered supply by Ron Francis, who was there at the right time to knock Walker around. You saw Walker, Shea Walker, walking out and talking to Francis here at number 11. What he is upset about is the fact that Francis came over and collared him around the neck for the tackle. He shouldn't be upset about that as much as he should be upset about the fact he didn't make the catch. He's going to get hit anyway. So AM fails on the third down opportunity. 
Second down opportunity. It's third down now. That's right. Third and seven. And it's stumped. Fake the play. He's going to punt it away. Not only a quarterback. Oh, almost had a chance there as Rod Harris hustled down. Almost had a chance to down that ball within the five, which was the plan there, as they got back into field goal position. 12.45 to go in the third. A&M failing to capitalize. Baylor has the football on their 20-yard line. Rutling, big opening. Crashing through to the 26-yard line. Johnny Holland is there. Second and four. Score of the ball game after Holland stopped there. The All-American, All-Southwest Conference player. Runs a 4.7 for the yard dash. That's quick for a linebacker. Real quick. Conference Defensive Player of the Year. Flags all over the place. I was looking at the 25-second clock. It looked like it might have been close. Baylor. Illegal movement. Five yards back. Ball starts. Still second down. Ball starts. Still second down. There's that clock I was telling you about. 25 seconds. Now ticking down. So the quarterback, no matter which direction he's going, there's one opposite at the other end. You can see the clock, see how much time he's has left to call that play. at all that is Murray and he is smashed by Kell that's one of the uh, 60 some formations that uh, Grant Tapp and company have cooked up for their offense at Baylor in fact they use at least 40 in each game and they've used 60 some over the course of the year but you can do that because Cody Carlson has had so much experience he's been playing sharing time for three years now he comes in has to control himself other players are in one position he knows them all so one play you have no backs the next play you got two McAdoo and Rutledge Carlson fires it out to Matt Clark he's got it at the 37 yard line Matt Clark making a fine catch over number 15, James Flowers. We're talking up to the defensive coordinator about his unit, and he said if there's any mix-up or confusion, you know, you'll see it very quickly on this team because our guys have to look at so many different formations that Baylor runs, and if somebody's wide open, it's probably a mix-up. Matt Clark. Gentleman who scored the touchdown in the first half to make it a 14-0 Baylor game at that point. First and 10 Bears, 36-yard line. Carlson, quick throw. That was intended for Davis at about the 40-yard line. Chet Brooks covering. Got 10 and a half minutes to go here in the third quarter. Still a 20-14 game. The Baylor offense is really forcing. This young team of Jackie Sherrill's to play a lot more man-to-man -man coverage than they would like. When they spread their receivers out, sometimes they'll have three receivers spread out, four, no backs. We can't even get them all in the camera shot. They're so far apart. That's right. Second and ten. That's Rutledge in motion again. The zip backfield. Carlson going to run it. No, he's going to fire, and it's caught there by Ben Baker at the 48-yard line. Now, Carlson showed some good mobility there. Looked like he was going to keep the ball and threw it at the last moment and connected on the first down toss. The connection on the first down toss, and he almost gets a couple of defenders for the Aggies hurt here. Number 27, Chet Brooks, will come across to make a hit, but he go he's really going to hit his own player, number 30, Alex Moore. It's right there. Well, when you, when you converge on the receiver, when the quarterback's scrambling around, it gets real difficult. It gets carry out there. <laughs> Another first down for Baylor as they move close to midfield. Pitch, Rutledge. Gain of about a yard. 
But you'll notice all the alliteration on this team. They got David Davis, Ben Baker, Randy Rutledge. It's going to all roll off the tongue. The parents were English majors. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Baylor. Number Cody Carlson, yeah, they got four on the starting alignment for offense. On the Baylor team, number 65, Joel Porter, the tackle. Interesting story about him. He was out singing, out watching a band sing. He and a few teammates joined in, invited them, invited them on stage, and they all sang all night long. <laughs> Second made it picked off. That's Chet Brooks at the 49-yard line. So Carlson and company moving the football. Trying to get it across midfield, and the big interception by 27, Chet Brooks for AM. Number 27, Chet Brooks, 5'11, 190 pounds. They say he is a tough player, maybe the best player in that defensive secondary. He has been shifting around all day long, reading his keys, trying to be on top of the receiver he thinks is going to make the play. Right that, at that moment, he read the play perfectly, comes up with the big interception. Chet Brooks. Last year, against Baylor, broke a kneecap. He was out for the rest of the year. He has special incentive today. In fact, he says, I just don't like Baylor. So a big pick here as Murray, little screen to Vic. Roger Vic. It's about a yard there as Baylor smelled that out pretty quickly. And number 43, Aaron Grant, came up along with Russell, Russell Sheffield. Vic, stop. Good looking Brooks there. There's Brooks. First name Terrence, but goes by Chet. What's important now for the Aggies is to be able to capitalize on the mistake. Had a mistake or the turnover. They, they got a turnover on the up, uh, interception earlier, but they didn't get any points out of it. Could not capitalize on the Flowers interception. Can they capitalize on the interception by Brooks? Murray, big rush, gets it off. It is caught by Harris at the 40-yard line. First down for AM. Right now, though, let's check in with Becky. Becky? Corey, as everyone knows, Baylor is bear country. Now, these beasts have been the team's mascot since back in the 1920s. The first time a bear was used as Baylor's mascot was in a game with Texas A&M. Everyone knows there's no love lost between the Aggies and the Bears, and perhaps this guy's uh, predecessors was even one of those who started the Aggies' jokes, and uh, perhaps that's why in 1956 a group of Aggie students kidnapped the Baylor Bear. So while the Aggies have their 12th man, the Baylor Bears for the Bears and catch a football. Corey? Roger Vick breaks loose inside the 30 to the 28 yard line. So AM working the ball into Baylor territory. Another first down. They're second in succession. And I like the way the Bear catches the football, by the way, Lynn Swan. <laughs> he did a good job. Right here, the man doing the best job is Roger Vick, number 43. Oh, he takes a hand off again. We haven't seen him break a tackle and run this well since the first quarter. When on the first run, he broke tackles and fumbled the football. That gain good for 13 yards. Vic with 41 on the day. And again, his number is called. This time he is hit hard at the line. Steve Grumbine out of Irving, Texas. The big left tackle makes the stop. All Southwest Conference performer. And Roger Vic, who rushed for 104 yards last week in the Houston game. The week before that, rushed for 104 yards against Texas Tech. And I have to believe that at halftime, Jackie Sherrill told him not to worry about the fumble. Go ahead, run hard. Just hold, hold on to it. Don't worry about it getting knocked out. Second and eight. Look out. Murray gets it off. He's got a man. It should be a pass interference call. They're going to give it to him. Yes. Flags at about the 80-yard line. That ball intended for Rod Harris. And out there, applying the coverage, number six for Baylor. That's Anthony Coleman. I believe we're going to see a pass interference call on Coleman. Here it is. Guard the flag. The pass was not catchable. But put the flag back in the pocket. They've determined the pass was not catchable. Do you like that rule, Lynn? And it's, it's a good call because why are you going to call pass interference when the receiver could not have made the catch? Murray just threw this one up. He was under, under pressure from the blitz. There's the push. The ball was thrown. But the ball, you see right oh. there, well out of bounds. The only way he would have caught that would have been if he were a 100-yard dash man running the, running the curb here Brilliant. on the track. And if he had caught it, he'd been out of bounds anyway. Third and eight. 8.18 eight to go in the third quarter. Murray. Check it off. He's got Vic right behind him to give to Vic. And he just crunches for a couple. There was no room at all. 
He gets up to about the 24-yard line. Russell Sheffield, the main man, to stop him there. Scott Slater is on the field. He's going to try for the field goal. Slater last week came up with four field goals against Houston. Junior out of Fort Worth, 11 of 14 on the year. This will be a 40-yard attempt. It is up and good. Good. The kick from Slater is good. 39 yards officially. It's a 20 to 17 ball game as AM takes advantage of the latest Baylor turnover. Corey. Thank you very much. A couple a, teams right here. What's that, man? That is a big upset. Uh, yeah, North Texas beating uh, TCU. And Joe Green works with the coaching staff over at North Texas State. Mean, mean Joe, Joe Green. He's on the board of the trustees there. Is he really? Yeah. Well, a couple teams that would like to end up their season at the Cotton Bowl going at it hot and heavy here. As you see that last drive after the Chet Brooks interception, a couple of minutes, the field goal by Slater. And it's a 20 to 17 ball game. AM trails by three, 746 to go. And Slater will kick it off right now for AM. McAdoo will bring it out. Still on his feet and brought down about the 24 yard line. Well, they keep their record intact. Nobody has returned one more than 29 yards against the 12th man. That one. Only 24. A lot of people were skeptical when uh, Jackie Sherrill announced his plans to bring in the 12th man concept, but it's worked extremely well here. And I think what it's done, too, as Jackie explained to us yesterday, it's brought the, the student body and the football players closer together because they these kids are all members of the student body, but be they cadets or general liberal arts students or what have you. There's a close meshing. Rushed. Johnny Holland comes in with a big stop. Johnny Holland, Holland from Hempston, Texas, only about 35, 40 miles from here. What a player. In fact, he was a quarterback back in high school. They switched him to safety. Sophomore year became a linebacker. Immediately, he was all Southwest Conference. Last year, as a junior, all Southwest Conference and all American. Duplicate his act from last season. Carlson, the keeper, and he's on his feet up to the 33-yard line. Corey, you, you always hear people referring, talking about help, helping another player out, not being out of position. On this last play, Cody's on the ball. A couple of players back there on defense, uh, one of which was Holland, Johnny Holland, sitting in position. Someone walked up behind him, told Holland to pop inside. In other words, on this defense, you got to play it inside. He jumps inside. Sure enough, here's the play right up the middle. He didn't make the tackle, but he took out a couple of blockers for his third, teammates. Third and two for Carlson and company. And Murray is across the 35-yard line. Good enough for first down yardage. So the Bears come through on the third down play. You know, the Carlson story is interesting as... Uh, most people know who follow the Southwest Conference, Carlson and Tom Mickey, the last three years shared time. This is the first year that Carlson has had the controls all by himself. And he worked very hard over the course of the summer to prepare himself for what would lie ahead. That was a short gainer from Charles Perry, two or three yards. He put on about 15 pounds of muscle Went through a strenuous running program. See the players, I mean, excuse me, the fans, all standing. 12th man concept. Again, 1922. The fans will stand to show that they are willing to help the team. They're called upon. Symbolic of their readiness to serve. <laughs> And good protection rifles it out at the 42 yard line it's caught there david davis david davis number one david davis having a pretty good ball game this afternoon 18 yards on that completion cody carlson showing he can pinpoint pass on the sideline also 
He just puts it right there, just one step short of being out of bounds. We are seeing today the two finest quarterbacks in the Southwest Conference in Murray and Carlson. Both extremely talented young men. First and ten from the AM 43-yard line. Again, calls his own number up to about the 35-yard line. So Carlson now over 60 yards on the ground today. John Roper out of Houston, Texas, makes a stop for AM. And the key man on that quarterback sneak is number 60 on that draw is number 65, Joel Porter. Now when he steps back, Cody Carlson, to have this play executed. Everybody shows pass. He takes off. And 65, Joel Porter has to come inside and get that middle linebacker. You see his passing stats over 230 yards. And on the ground, he's got 64 yards. This time, Rutledge is smashed for a loss. There's a flag on the play. The man to provide the first hit was Larry Kell. Corey, you know, I have a feeling I know what he's going to call on unsportsmanlike conduct piling on. But from my view, looking through my binoculars at that play, looked like he just flew over the top. Oh, no, the face mask. Face mask. Didn't see it. I didn't see that one either. We'll take another look. Kelm right there. Is that it? Grabs the right side? Yeah. Yes. 65, Larry Kelm. Obviously unintentional. Five-yard face mask penalty defense. First down. So that pushes the ball up to the 30-yard line, just outside the 30-yard line. We've got four minutes and 35 seconds to go here in the third. Baylor a three-point lead. She looks a little like Linda Carter in the, right, in the red and white stripe. Yes, she does. A few of the fans enjoying themselves. That's Simpson at the top of your screen. Who's that track star? So let's look and see if they don't fire it out to him. No, they give it to Rutledge. Looking to bang across on the left side. Does so for a gain of three yards on the play. Again, Larry Kelm is there. He's all over the place. Larry Kelm, a smart player. Just read that Baylor offensive unit, moved down the line. Traditionally, this AM team on defense doesn't like to read a lot. They just like to play aggressive, fire off the ball kind of defense. Fly around. Yeah, but with all this all the different offensive formations that Baylor run, they rarely have to get their heads up and see what's going on, then move. One of the things that R.C. Slocum was worried about, the defensive coordinator, a complicated game plan. Timeout, Carlson. One second left on the 25-second clock. He knew he couldn't get that play off. Just got it in on time. So it's a second and seven with 3.35 to go on the third as the Bears hang on to the lead. Always a tough ball game when you get state rivalries that, that have such a long history. You almost have to throw away the record books and just say, try and scrape and come out on top. Second and seven. 27 yard line of AM. Carlson to give Rutledge nice hole across the 20 inside to the 17 yard line where Johnny Holland brings Rutledge down. So Baylor's offense is moving. Watch it again. One of the things they were concerned about when they faced this offense of Baylor is that big offensive line and their ability just to drive people off the ball and to move steadily downfield. All of their scoring has come very quickly with the exception of the one field goal at the end of the first half. Now it looks as though they're driving again steadily. Murray kind of hurdles his way inside the 15 to the 13 yard line. And that offensive line is doing the job. Guys like Addicts and Don Robinson, the big right tackle. Well, the AM coaches mentioned us as really a comer. Excellent for players. Joel Porter, 6'4, 270. Kyle Lane, 6'1, 245. Addicts, 6'2, 270. Bates, 271. Robinson, 280. Addicts and Bates, supposed to be the two strongest players in the whole team. That's Douglas in motion. Carlson. The pitch, Murray, inside the 10, dives to about the seven yard line on that second and sixth play. And I think he's got the first down. The great play of the veer by number 27, Chet Brooks. And Murray is down on the near side. And that's Carlson looking over, trying to figure out how seriously Murray may be injured. 
One of the things that's so tough to stop in terms of this veer are the chop blocks, the cut blocks of the main and the cornerbacks. Real tough to get a cornerback to learn how to take those on and move. You see they force a pitch. Chet Brooks is on the sideline. He's being blocked. He takes that block, sheds it, then comes to the outside to make a, a, real, a real tough tackle on Murray. Just barely gets him as he's going down. He's hit again by number Corrington. 10, Kip Corrington. Corrington is only 5'11", 171 pounds, but his reputation does precede him as a tough player, as a hitter. Well, as Jackie says, this guy splatters people. That was a nice effort by Murray, a second effort there to get an extra three, four yards after the initial hit. Yeah, but just as just as Vix lost the ball in the second effort in the first quarter, yeah. put himself in an awkward position where he didn't see a tackler. Murray does the same thing here by trying to get Jeffrey by trying to get the extra yards. You know, stretches his body out, puts himself in the position where he cannot protect himself. And then number 10, Kip Corrington comes up and is able to get in the extra hit. And you can't fault Corrington for coming in trying to make the hit. He's trying to stop him from getting the extra yards. He doesn't make the hit. That might have been another yard and a half, two yards, which, as you know, can be a big difference when you're down inside the 10-yard line. Murray out of Houston, Texas, a freshman leading Brown Gainer coming in with 317 yards for the Bears and an impressive 5.8 average per carry. All right, here we go. It's first and goal from the six-yard line. Rutledge and Connor to give Rutledge right up the gut. Inside the five to the three-yard line. So the Bears simply pounding away. Just, just as we talked about Texas getting a boost when they had that goal line stand, this could be a very big boost to the offensive line of Baylor if they can push it in because they are really controlling the line of scrimmage. Beer, Carlson, touchdown. AM looked to be prepared for the ball right up the interior line. Did not happen. Carlson on the veer decides to keep and he scores the touchdown. This drive started with seven minutes and 40 seconds on the clock. They steadily moved downfield, using the pass only when they had to, punching it down. There's 141 left to play in the third quarter. That drive taking up six minutes and five seconds. Extra point is good. So Cody Carlson takes it in. His first touchdown on the ground this year in front of a crowd of 74,000 plus here at Kyle Field. It's a 10-point game. Brought down to the 26-yard line. The crowd today, as Lillia mentioned, 74,000 plus, 74,739 to be exact. And we've learned that's the largest home crowd for a non-Texas game ever at Texas a and and when we say non-Texas, we mean non-University of Texas. That's right. Texas University, because all the teams, with the exception of one, Arkansas. in the Southwest Conference, all are in the state of Texas. <laughs> Minute 37 to go, third quarter. Murray, quick drop. That ball intended for Bernstein. Did not have a lot on that ball. Thrown low and well behind Bronski. Murray wants to make something happen, but as I stated before, he has to stay away from trying to do it all on his own. Take his time. So it's second and ten. Complete at the 40-yard line. Thomas Everett, the All-American, back there to cover for Baylor. We said earlier that number 17, Rod Harris, was not afraid to go in the middle, make the catch, knowing that Everett is in that center of the field. Doesn't make it any easier. But yet, he still goes in there when Kevin puts the ball down the middle, sacrificing his body, stretching out. 
One of the problems, though, that Murray does have, uh, the AM offense does have, they really don't have that burner, that guy with the exceptional speed that can fly out there and catch up to that football when Murray lays it out. Third and ten. Murray is going to be brought down, I think. No. It's away. Look at that move. Tosses it out and caught. Jay Walker. The 48-yard line. And Murray provides an excellent imitation of a magician on that play. I thought for sure he was down for a big loss, but fires it out the last minute to Shea Walker, a 22-yard gain. He does an excellent job, like you, Corey. I thought he was down. The pocket's collapsing all around him. He has to find some more time. Now, he's got Shea running around with Ron Francis on him. He spots him, and Shea just stops and goes backwards. He picks it up. What great eyes for Kevin Murray to pick that up, then throw it inside Francis for the catch. Very impressive play by Murray and by Walker. First down AM, 48 yard line. The rifle pass right in the sun, and Harris makes the catch nonetheless. Again, that's got to be a tough ball coming out of the shade into the sun. You're looking at the ball behind the line of scrimmage. The quarterback's throwing from the shade. You've got to focus in on them. This is a rocket pass to the sideline for a five-yard gain. You see it right in the sun. His eyes have to make that quick adjustment to the ball coming in. He does so, almost breaks away from Francis for a bigger gain. Eight yards on the play. Woodside. Breaks through for a gain of about five. Keith Woodside out of Vidalia, Louisiana. This kid's a game breaker. I'll tell you, he, he probably is a little upset with himself there. He broke through that line. There was a bit of contact around his legs. Lost his balance, and he went down. They maintain that balance. That could have been one of those big game breakers. Woodside, a few years ago, was the top rusher in Louisiana. Jackie Sherrill scooped him up before LSU could get after him. The third quarter has ended. Underway, A&M on the Baylor 39-yard line. This is Kevin Murray. And that is Ron Bernstein. 25-yard line. Look at him go. Down to the 22 fumble. No. That will not go to Baylor. I think they will rule the ball was forced out by the ground. And the ground cannot cause a fumble once the player's knee hits the ground. That play is dead. So a big gainer, and Bernstein shows again some of that great athletic ability he has. Rod Bernstein shows why he's got that talent, why they think so highly of him. His 4.5 speed, he has good strength, crossing pattern, simple crossing pattern across the field. He turns it into a big game. 23 yards, as a matter of fact. 17-yard line. That's Woodside. Now to about the 13, maybe the 14 yard line as Robert Waters comes up to make that stop. Way and and you just got a feeling the way they're moving that football, unless they make a mistake here, they may be going in. Yes, it's, see the stats there for the for three quarters of play. Texas A&M not having a great deal of success off the ground. Most of it coming in the air. 222 yards worth. Very similar passing statistics through three quarters. That was Bernstein in motion. Murray up in the air. Tony Thompson, the great catch at the four-yard line. Wow. Ron Francis right there. Thompson way up in the air and knocked off his feet. One of the real tough catches that any wide receiver can make. He is being hit up in the air. He is off balance, and yet he is going to come down with this catch. You see it there from the end zone. The ball zips right in there. He goes up, stretched out. He's hit low. Could have been flipped up on his head, but he comes down with the catch. Mix up in the backfield. You saw Murray tried to hand it off to Roger Vick. Somehow they did not connect, and Murray is lucky to retain the ball. Loses a couple back to the five-yard line. That was a scary situation for AM fans. Not a bad day for Murray. 256 yards throwing and one touchdown. No interceptions. He came into this ball game having thrown seven touchdowns, excuse me, six touchdowns and seven interceptions. Murray is three short of the all-time conference and school touchdown mark. 
going to try to make it too short here. Murray tosses it up in the far corner. Touchdown. Woodside is there. This is where a quarterback, when he has the mobility, it really pays off. He's under pressure. He just slides away from it, waits, and finds Keith Woodside in the back of the end zone. Those are very nice pass, Corey. A lot of touch on the ball. Woodside, the top receiver out of the backfield. In fact, that's his second touchdown catch of the year as Murray and Woodside hook up to make it a three-point game. You see Woodside, he knows he's now drifted away from coverage. He's open. Signaling, throw me the football, and here comes one that <laughs> is so easy to catch. Nice touch into the backfield. And the man out there trying to stop that touchdown, the All-American, number 27, Thomas Everett. The 27-24 ball game. Time by number nine, Craig Stump. Boy, it really was. And there's Murray. Two touchdown catches today. He gives him 39 for his career, and he just moved ahead of the great Sammy Baugh on the all-time Southwest Conference touchdown roster. And ahead of him, just two touchdowns, or I should say one touchdown ahead of him, Ed Hargan, the old A&M quarterback, and Chuck Hickson, who played his ball at SMU. They both finished their careers with 40. So the next touchdown toss, and Murray throws. Look out. Nice run there by Todd Connor as Baylor moves it out in a hurry to about the 29-yard line, a nine-yard pickup. Don't expect Baylor to rest and think that they are just going to be able to grind it out and win this football game easily. They know they're in a battle. They're going to have to fight. Keep in mind, it was the Texas A&M Aggies who were down by 17 points, came back to within three, then within six at the end of the first half. That's Connor again. First down, Baylor. Right now, let's see what Becky Dixon is up to. Becky, where are you? Corey, I'm down on the sidelines. I just talked to Kevin Murray on the touchdown pass. He said he didn't see Woodside at first. He glanced over, picked him up late, and got the job done. He certainly did. When you talk about having good eyes and seeing the field, having that ability to scramble, pick up someone late, is part of that. First and ten, Baylor. Way up in the air, Carlson, and it is caught. caught. Unbelievable. That's John Simpson at the 26-yard line. He had two men all over him, Holly and Corrington, and somehow Simpson grabs the football. This ball is just hanging up in space. Cody Carlson must have a great deal of confidence in this young man because he was extremely well covered. The ball thrown up, the uh, defender right in front of him. He just goes up higher over his shoulder and makes a great leap inbounds. What a terrific says, grab. Yes, yes, here's the football. 40-yard <laughs> gain for Baylor. There at the A&M, 27-yard line. The Veer, and that's Jackie Ball. Inside the 25 to 23 yard line, Jackie Ball's first carry of the afternoon ball. An experienced player, a senior, a junior rather, out of Beaumont, Texas. You can see it's been a catch up day all day long for AM. It certainly has, and Baylor has been so consistent scoring in every quarter of this ball game. That's ball again. Gain of about two yards. Sammy O'Brien takes him down and ball, incidentally, in case you're wondering, his brother, yes, his brother is Jerry. Jerry Ball is the All-American nose guard for SMU. Grant Tapp, Jackie Sherrill. Keep in mind, this Baylor team coming into this 1986 season, they were ranked. Number eight in the country before slipping after a couple of losses. Carl 
Jackson is hammered. Holland is there. The man to make the initial stop, though, is number 73, Todd Howard. So Howard and Holland combined to bring Carlson down for a loss. And this is just excellent defensive play. You see Howard takes on the blocker, sheds him the false read, and wraps up Cody Carlson. And number 11, Holland, comes in to help him finish it off. Sets up a fourth and seven, and who is on but Terry Seiler, who's kicked one for 32 and the other for 20, both in the first half. If he can hit this one here, it would be a 41-yard field goal. It's up, and I don't know. Yes! What a day for Seiler. His third field goal. And a and drops again 10 points back. That's his longest kick of the year. With the Hayes belt, has told ABC Sports that he's going to go to the Oklahoma-Nebraska game so he can meet one of his three idols, the boss. Look up Seiler and see if he's... <laughs> 30-24 is our score. Just under nine and a half minutes to go. Rod Harris says, no, thank you. We'll keep it in the end zone and bring it out to the 20-yard line. As the shadow continues to creep across Kyle Field, got about 95% of it covered now. Started out in bright sunshine. It's been a beautiful day. We are seeing one heck of a football game. Both these teams certainly have the talent, the ability to represent this conference at the Cotton Bowl. a and would like to make it two years straight. Right now, though, there's six points down. Murray lost it up, and it is incomplete. The intended receiver, number 43 out of the backfield, Roger Vick. Ron Francis came up. The ball deflected. Could have been picked off. Well, yeah, one receiver running away from him towards the goal line. Another receiver coming back to him trying to make this play. And the receiver coming back is also bringing a defensive man with him right here into the coverage. Receivers have to be smart and heads up when they come back to a scrambling quarterback not to bring a man into coverage if the ball is going to someone else. That's to Roger Vick at about the 28-yard line. So Vick shows that he, too, can catch the ball out of the backfield like his teammate, Keith Woodside. Well, that ball was thrown low, and he had the poise and control just to go down, make the catch, pick up the nine yards. Him down there. You see number 77 out there. It's a good shot. Big Marshall land as they give the first down to AM. Vic with 46 yards on the day so far. Look at the top 10 teams in action today and tonight. Arizona State, as you see, Lynn. I saw leading that Southern Cal. Leading my team. I, I got to point these things out to you. <laughs> the right. fourth quarter of the play. That's right. 8.08 to go. Murray, oh. and that ball either slipped or was deflected out of his grasp. I'm not sure which. Number Scott 35, Works was Scott Works was jumping up and down like he was a man responsible just to let us know. <laughs> in case we couldn't see it, just and we did. In case we couldn't see it, we, we appreciate that, Scott. Thank you very much. You see, he gets his hands right up in the air. That's it high enough so it goes over the head of number 17, Rod Harris. Thanks, Scott, for his help there. All right, sets up a second and ten. Robert Blackman comes over to drive him down. 
Picked up six yards on that play, so it makes it a third and fourth long for a situation. Now they can look forward to dumping it off, maybe a short pass to someone from the backfield, uh, someone crossing as opposed to having to go downfield 10 yards to pick it up. Murray went to his favorite target, and Bernstein comes through with the first down catch. Possession receiver, when you need a catch, you go to the player who comes through for you, who is consistent. But part of that is that the defense also knows you're going to him. In this case, they decided to blitz. They played man-to-man -man coverage, and Ron Bernstein comes on top. Bernstein with 72 yards in receiving. Murray scrambling, gets it off, and it's caught. And I'm telling you what, Murray again, showing that excellent athletic ability, scrambling, maneuvering, looking for the open receiver, and he got crushed at the end of this play. I'll tell you one thing, Chuck Connor's rifle couldn't move any faster <laughs> with any more velocity than the one of Kevin Murray right here. He just whips it all arm to the outside to Thompson, who puts a good move on Francis, gets a little help from Woodside downfield, number 33, and he has the first down to keep the Aggie drive alive. Timeout for Baylor, and you know what's amazing is the way Murray can throw that ball that hard off of one leg and on the run. It's a 30-24 ball game. We got seven minutes to go. Stay with us. Announcing the Valvoline Four Guard, I Love a Parade Sweepstakes. Win a trip for four to four of America's greatest parades. To enter, watch the next commercial and remember what the driver of the smoking car says. Then go to a participating store for details. By six, and I think each team has really shown the ability to put points on the board and do it very, very quickly. So keeping that in mind, if the Aggies go down here and score, they have a one-point lead. Oh. Baylor has the ability to go the length of the field in less than two minutes. Unquestionably, each team with tremendous striking power. Roger Vick avoids one tackle. Gets outside, but Everett comes up. Along with James Lee. Bring him down after a gain of two. You know, in this in this box that we're announcing from, we have a very interesting view with all the fans right here in front of us. And on that last play, I thought it looked like it might have been an inadvertent face mask. And all the fans up in front of us were sitting here raising their hands like a claw, hoping that their official would call that face mask. Ball the 44-yard line. The clock continues to tick. Less than six and a half minutes to go for the game. I can't believe he threw that ball. <laughs> he was tightly covered by Ron Francis, number 11. Ron Francis has really been in this ball game all afternoon, making some great plays. But you have to see the confidence that Kevin Murray has his arm. He throws it fairly low trajectory pass. He's looking at number 41 out there, Johnny Thompson. I mistakenly called him Ron Francis. Thought he was number 11. Had his back turned to the passer. In that situation, it's not as dangerous as long as he doesn't turn around when that ball gets there. That's the chance you take. Thomas says, you know, when another one of those NCAA All-American tracksters, he can fly. And the connection to Bernstein right at the first down marker, the 35-yard line. And Grant Tapp is right there trying to make sure that the uh, ball placement is accurate. <laughs> First down, a and at the 35-yard line. The Baylor sideline is real upset. They don't think he made the first first down. Now he makes his catch right at the marker, but let's watch and see where the ball is. Does the ball cross the marker? It's real tough to tell. His body is right on the marker, but we can't tell where the ball is. Grant Depp is right there to get his money's worth in. Vic hurdles over one man, keeps the legs puffing. And a nice run up to the 25-yard line, 26-yard line. A gain of about eight yards. Make it nine yards on the play. Good explosion right off the ball. Great explosion as he carries his 15th time in the ball game for 56 yards. Kevin Murray is still the man in this ball game. 
see there over 300 yards passing and no interceptions this afternoon. Roger Vick barrels to the 22-yard line. I have to believe, Corey, that with all the success Murray has had passing the football, mostly to the outside, this afternoon he has that Baylor defense spread from sideline to sideline. They've opened it up a bit on the inside, so now their ground attack is punching it out down the center. Two things that's going to happen. It's going to run the clock now while they're in scoring position and maybe continue to soften up that defense. Murray, pitch, Woodside, look at him go. 10-5 at the end, no, out of bounds in the two-yard line, but Keith Woodside, the man who can explode, who can turn a corner in a second, good for 20 yards, and a and is knocking again. Roger Vick is usually the man in charge of the running attack. He dislocated a finger, missed two weeks, and it was Keith Woodside who had to, burn, had to carry the weight of the running attack. He shows that he was quite capable of carrying that load. Woodside and Vic. Woodside and Vic. Doing the job today for Jackie Sherrill and the Aggies. Vic, not this time. Vic has got to be careful. He has done this a couple of times in the afternoon. He has come to that center of the pile. He's struggling trying to get more yards. That time he was wheeling, rolling over towards his right with that ball sticking out, just holding on to it with one hand. Somebody hits that with a good solid shot, the ball can pop loose. Right now, the Aggies are playing the clock. Robert Waters, the man to come up and meet Vic very hard at the line of scrimmage. Ball's on the two yard line. The 25 second clock had run down to eight. They wisely take a timeout, so with 4.38 to play in the ball game, trailing by six. The Aggies are in scoring position. A Ranger never takes the easy way out. You're reaching deep inside you for things you've never known. Go! That's why getting into the Rangers is tough, and the training is tough. Be all that you can be. So it makes me feel like I'm part of something really special. And I'm not the only one. When you buy a Nissan 300ZX, you buy a legend, a tradition of many Z cars, each meticulously made to the tolerance of an expensive watch. You buy a racing heritage unmatched by any car in its class. But most of all, when you buy the awesome 300ZX, you buy Nissan. The quality and performance is 300ZX. The name is Nissan. A battle of the unbeatens. Alabama is second ranked in the nation. Paterno's Penn State squad is number five. Coverage begins with college football today, next Saturday. Four minutes and 38 seconds to go here in the fourth quarter. A&M has yet to lead in this ballgame. They trail by six. They have an opportunity to tie it up here. Second and two. The extra point would put them in front, but at first they got to score. Roger Vick left side of no. Uh-uh. He is stopped out there. Guys like Johnny Thomas and James Lee in there to come up with a big defensive stop for Baylor. Oh, this is a great, great job on the Baylor defense. Just when they need it most, they penetrate, they get across the line of scrimmage. Vic can't even find a hole, can't see daylight, can't see anything but green and white. Johnny Thomas, the man to really smell that play up, come up with a big pop. Right on, Vic, and now it's third and goal. Things are getting tense in Kyle Field. comes Waters, and it is caught! Thompson! Thompson, the catch! Tony Thompson and Ron Harris exchange mid-air high fives after a terrific catch in the end zone. The 
ball popped loose. He lost sight of it momentarily, went up and grabbed it, and AM is one point away from the lead. The biggest pressure play of the day, number 44, Waters blitzing on the play. Kevin gets it off. Thompson is there. He juggles it a bit, but still hangs on to it. And the all-important extra point is up and good from Scott Slater. And the Aggies are in front, 31 to 30. Their first lead of the ball game with three minutes and 48 seconds to go. And for Kevin Murray, his third touchdown catch of the day, he is now even with Chuck Hickson and Ed Hargan in the all-time Southwest Conference touchdown list. The Aggies are in front for the first time in the ball game, but not necessarily in control. <laughs> you better believe that. The Baylor offense is going to get this ball back. They have scored touchdowns in less than two minutes on two different occasions in this ball game on drives of 64 yards and one of 76 yards. They can do it again here. They have three minutes and 48 seconds to go in this ball game. There's the man who made the grab right there. That's Tony Thompson, a sophomore out of Houston, Texas. First touchdown catch of the year. You can see this place is going nuts right now. Scott Slater is on for the kick. The towel whipping around this stadium. 74,000 plus. And Aggie Land is a hot place to be right now. The 12th man has done a good job. He's put the ball in the end zone a couple of times. The biggest return of the day for Baylor has been 24 yards. No reason to doubt they will not come through here, but the Baylor Bears have upset mine. Bounding out at about the 14-yard line. Of course, the flag comes out. Texas A&M. Trying to stay undefeated in the conference. They are 2-0 coming in, 4-1 overall. The Bears coming into this ballgame, 4-2, and 2-1 and and in the conference. And don't forget, next week right here on ABC, another great football game on tap, Penn State and Alabama. Mike Shula, of course, leads Alabama. He's a Heisman Trophy candidate. John Schaefer, the quarterback for Penn State. Always a good matchup. The Crimson Tide takes on the Nittany Lion. We'll have that for you next week right here at ABC. Tony Thompson, the man who caught that touchdown pass, has had a good afternoon. The yards have not been great, but they've been key. Six catches for 50 yards. Later blasted it again, out of bounds at the 15 or the 14 yard line. So we'll do the whole thing one more time. We'll sh we'll Here's show the you go ahead it. touchdown. Murray hitting Thompson. You see the pressure right there, right in his face, and he stands poised. And he finds Thompson. Thompson makes a catch after juggling it for five yards. Oh, he is so lucky that one of the players, number six, Anthony Coleman, who was covering him on that play, didn't reach up. Knock that ball away from him. Murray now, incidentally, 25 of 40 for 308 yards and three touchdowns. And no interception. No INTs. He is one yard away from his best performance in his career, yardage-wise. He did that last year against Tulsa with 309 yards and four touchdowns. This year, his best performance against LSU in a losing cause. Connected on 24 of 35 attempts for 225 yards. Consistent, big play quarterback. Smart, good speed, good eyes looking downfield, and a leader. You know, I asked him about these records, the conference records, school records. He doesn't really care about that. All he wants to do is win ball games, which he's going to try to do today. That was... 35 for Baylor. Scott Works brought that ball up in relatively decent position now at the 42-yard line with three minutes and 43 seconds to go after two consecutive penalties. 
Quater could not get the ball to stay in bounds. Couldn't get it to stay in bounds, so that four they could get the ball yards. at the 41 yard line. Now they only have to go 59 for the touchdown. Cody Carlson intended for Douglas, and he wasn't there. Right about midfield. They had the blitz going there in an effort to put more pressure on Cody Carlson, playing man-to-man -man coverage, trying to force him to stay with his short passing game. The receivers are going to be tightly covered by that secondary of Texas. And there. formation the Baylor Bears spread out the Aggie defense they had no no one in the backfield the last man went in motion to try and spread them out but right there in the center all-american linebacker Johnny Howard Holland playing smart football stopped him for a three-yard game now look what the players are doing for a and guys like Clem hey come on let's hear it and boy are they here no thanks. Let's take time out. And again, Lynn, just like a moment ago, the clock ran down. Didn't have time to get the job done. I think he was audible or perhaps thinking about it at the time. Had to call time out just to save the penalty. Yeah, he just took too much time to get it done. Ran out. And now he doesn't have any more timeouts left in the ball game. They have used all their timeouts. That could come back to haunt them before it's over today. Hey, Monday night, we mentioned it earlier. Don't forget about it, though. A great NFL matchup. The undefeated Denver Broncos take on the New York Jets. The Broncos lead in the AFC West. The Jets in the AFC East. John Elway and company against uh, Kenny O'Brien, who should be healthy for the game on Monday night. Should be a great matchup. Two clubs that can uh, light up the old scoreboard, much like uh, we're seeing today. John Elway on offense at Denver Broncos. Oh, defense, the defense is, is very, very tough. They've always been tough and aggressive. Always came away with bruises after playing them. And up in New York, few of the former coaches for the Steelers, Dan Radakovich is there. Fred right. Carson is a defensive coordinator. We talk about nightmares. <laughs> Mark Gastineau, Marty Lyon. Yeah. Head the other way when you see those guys. Fair enough to make you stay awake forever. Baylor on the day, 427 yards on offense. They've been averaging 454, so they're right there. Third and seven. This is huge. Carlson being chased gets it off, and it is not going to be caught. And uh, knocks it away. It was intended for Douglas. Holly over there. Along with Corrington. You'll see the pressure coming from the inside. He's got a half roll going here. Number 90, Sammy, Sammy O'Brien, coming in from the inside. He has to throw this one in a hurry. He throws it to the outside, and Texas A&M was in the best position. Chet Brooks supplied the coverage along with Torrington. Now it's fourth and seven, and this could be the ball game. They're going for it. From the 42, again, good pressure from AM and he is down. Gonna be grounding. Jay Mueller, number 82, 6'3, 250 pounds. Defensive end. As a man who comes in and makes a play. Who cares about the grounding now? It was fourth down anyway. They can't lose another down. They don't own the football. Look at the pressure from the outside. They force him in the pocket. And look, right there, Jay Mueller crawling, scrapping on the ground, trying to get every inch he can. He finally comes up with the legs of Cody Carlson. Besides Muller, you had 83 Roper, and they're also providing the pressure from the other side. And combined, Carlson had nowhere to go. Tried somehow to get a pass off, and of course that happened as he was falling down. So with 2.42 to go, perhaps we've seen Baylor's last breath, but don't kiss it away just yet. There's a lot of time and a lot of things gonna happen here, but a big, big defensive play for AM. 
on the fourth and seven. It's their football on the 37. And that's Vic who plows to the 34-yard line. Obviously, what the Texas A&M team will do is possess the football, keep the ball on the ground, try and run out the clock. They've got 25 seconds in which the play has to be run, but the play itself will take up more time. Baylor has no timeouts. They cannot stop the clock. The only way this clock is going to stop is if the Aggies stop it by throwing a pass or making a mistake. They should get someone behind them in the backfield to protect the football just in case it does pop loose. Second down. That's Vic. That's the left side. And again, Russell Sheffield is there. They're not looking for big yardage. You're looking to soak up that clock here as we're under two minutes in the ballgame. Depending how fast these young men get set and the officials start that 25 second clock will dictate whether or not Baylor has to get, uh, excuse me, and the Aggies have to get a first down in order to maintain possession. And with a minute 37 and counting on the clock, I believe they just might have to do that, Corey, to maintain possession. To I think they will. Possession. We're looking at third and six right now. The ball is on the 33 yard line. The clock keeps ticking. The Baylor Bears are going to try and really come after the football. The Aggies call a timeout. They let the clock run down too far and couldn't get a playoff, so they had to call a timeout. Or the, or the other thinking, as we sit here and brainstorm a bit as to what's going on, right. they may have just decided to let the clock run down to one second, call the timeout. It's third down and about six or long six for a first down. You run the clock down every possible second, call the timeout, then come to the sideline, discuss with your coach what play to run. If you should take the chance and put the ball in the air, or if you should just run a sweep, keep it on the ground to use up more of the clock, then you're in first, fourth down situation, or if you get the first down, obviously it's just drop on the ball and run the rest of the clock out. Jackie Sherrill talking things over. If you're thinking ahead a little bit, A&M, will take on Rice. will be on the road against SMU. They'll take on Arkansas on the road. Then host TCU and of course the big Texas game. There is no bigger game on the A&M schedule year in, year out. Baylor, TCU, Arkansas, Rice, and they close with Texas. Baylor again as Grant Tapp looks on hoping for a mistake, hoping to get that ball back somehow, some way. Set 79, his clubs have averaged seven wins a year. And it's Keith Woodside, he's not gonna make the first down yardage. A minute 15 to go, a minute 14 to go. I think they're just a bit too far. If, if, even if they're thinking about it to try for a field goal, the right. field position would be too good. They'll they don't wanna give them that field down. position, no. If they're going to punt the football. I think they'll just again let the clock run down as far as they can and for the call the next play. Less than 10 seconds on the 25 second clock in case you're wondering. And 45 on the game clock. You really have to give the respect to this Texas football team, a and football team after having trailed throughout this entire afternoon, having the intestinal fortitude to stay in there, hang tough, come back and grab a one point lead with only seconds. 41 to be exact, remaining in this ballgame. They took the time penalty to lay a game penalty, which pushes them back, and now they will punt it away. That's Craig Stump. We've got exactly 41 seconds to go. Well, of course, try to sneak it in, but he instead booms it to the end zone. So, Cody Carlson and company will have one final shot after that 32-yard kick from Stump. They've got 35 seconds left to work some magic. Now again, if you're thinking about a couple long passes, Siler has had a great day for Baylor with three field goals, the longest of the day, the 41-yarder here in the fourth quarter. So his confidence is intact. It's up. If they get down to where they think he can kick that field goal, obviously they will do it. They might also bring on Mark Mailer, who usually kicks the long ones. Carlson, by the way, 15 to 27, 273 yards on the day and a touchdown with two interceptions. The roar continues at Kyle Field. Carlson going up, and it is caught by AM. Intercepted, I believe. Yes. 
Jeff Holly, number two, back there deep in their pre-men coverage for the Aggies. Cody Carlson drops back, knows he has to go for a pass downfield, locked it one up because he also had pressure. Watch it again here. Carlson throws up his third interception of the day. You see number 99, Sandler, looping in from the inside. You see the ball go up, off the mark to the outside. Number two, Jeff Halley is right there. Holly is right there to make the grab. All three interceptions by Carlson in this half, incidentally. So now with 28 seconds to go, unless something completely unbelievable happens, it looks like A&M has got this thing wrapped up as Murray falls down, the clock under 20 seconds to go. 74,000 plus on their feet, and the vast majority of them with big smiles on their faces right now. They should be very happy. The Aggies overcame some big plays they gave away. They allowed the Baylor team to have 17 points. They come back, and now the game is over. So it's one by one, 31 to 30. That's it. You see Grant Taft in the middle of your screen, one of the classiest guys in football, the man who came into the program at Baylor Inheriting a 3-28 and 28 record after three years, and boy, what wonders he's worked at Baylor. 31-30, Texas A&M. That's your final score here at Kyle Field. Let's look at the winning touchdown one more time as A&M works from behind the whole day and finally takes the lead on this play. And this play epitomizes what they had to face all afternoon. Pressure from the Baylor defense. Pressure in the secondary, but determined in a concentrated effort by the receivers, by the running backs, by the line results, and this touchdown catch by Thomas. Tony Thompson makes the catch, and that was the difference. As the yell leader is being carried off the field, the Aggies are celebrating at Kyle Field. Universal life, a philosophical breakthrough. It's not philosophy, it's a kind of life insurance from Metropolitan. Universal life means the cash value of your insurance earns interest at competitive market rates. Universal